Welcome to Midwest Paranormal Presents Paranormal Soup. I'm your host, Jason Bland, and tonight we have guest Bill Donahue. He's the author of a new book. Well, someone new. It came out last November, but it's finally I'm getting him on the show. I'm 15 chapters into this book. It's called Burn Beautiful Soul. We're going to be talking about demons. It's a fiction book, but it, it, it's an interesting book about a demon who decides to join the, uh, the world of advertising. It, it's more than that, but there, it's a dark comedy, but it's really good, and I'm truly enjoying it. He's also the author of uh, books too much poison brain cradle filthy beast and a few others i believe we're going to talk to him tonight about what influenced him to write about demons his own personal experiences he, he's from pennsylvania so you know he's had a number of haunting experiences everybody i know from pennsylvania has got a good ghost story or, or at least a couple of them so we'll talk to him about all that tonight and we will open up the phone lines later in the show of course we were gone last week so i have a lot of weird it was really hard a lot of ufo this is gonna be a lot of ufo stuff in the World Wide web of weird uh it seems like ufo activities picked up even there was one i don't have this in the worldwide web weird i saw this yesterday shaquille neal <laughs> you know the basketball seven foot tall guy uh filmed the ufo I, I just saw that recently so yeah maybe they're they're here no wrong wrong genre no i don't know we need a good ufo reference there maybe the aliens are coming that, that'd be the least of our problems probably right now but we got a lot to get to so let's go ahead and get rolling on into it Welcome to another night of Paranormal Soup. Uh, but, you know, this damn time change. Damn time change is just ruined me today. <laughs> <laughs> I even took a half day from work. I was so tired. So tired, I forgot my uh, own father's birthday. Happy birthday, Dad. You're out there uh, watching. I'm sorry. I was going to have the boys call you. They were going to call you tomorrow because they, they were planning on calling you for your birthday. And then I, I totally spaced on that. So happy birthday, Dad. So sorry. So sorry. But yeah, can we get rid of daylight savings time already? I mean, I think every single person I know ever says, yes, let's get rid of it. Yeah, I've not met somebody who's like, no, I like daylight savings time. I, I mean, I'm sure there are people that some reason like it. But I, 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 I have not met one. And I literally, if I'm off tonight, I blame it on daylight savings time. <laughs> totally on daylight. Even my computer has got the wrong time. I, how does that happen? It should know to change, right? It's saying it's, you know, 9 o'clock my time when it's 10. You know, it's screwed everything up. But anyways, we are back, finally, after uh, being gone from not here last week. But uh, joining me, as always, is my beautiful co-host, Jamie D. How you doing tonight, Jamie? doing well jason thank you and i thought we did decide that we were going to do away with daylight savings a couple of years ago I, there's always been like some person that tries to pass it in a state there's never i don't think they've done anything never done anything federally uh in indiana they tried to but then different counties and townships couldn't decide if we want to be eastern or central so that that screwed the pooch here so yeah never happened all the way down in was central time your time right you had it you got the same thing as me rob autry from florida how you doing no man it's uh eastern time here oh it's eastern time it's 11 so, you know, here. it's 11 eastern yeah we all lost an hour yesterday time travel that's not yeah. the time travel i love it when we gain an hour <laughs> if it always gained an hour i wouldn't complain right right so yeah. yes, like I, like I said, we have guest uh, Bill Donahue or William Donahue as you know, and you'll see on the book, William J. Donahue uh, is going to join us after the World Wide Web of Weird. He's the author of Burn Beautiful Soul. I've been, I'm 15 chapters into this book. I am loving it. And I highly recommend it if you want a good piece of uh, fiction about a demon. <laughs> Definitely pick this up. All right, but we do got a lot of weird to get to, and I, like I said, there was plenty. I, I really had to like decide what am I going to cover because there's so much after being gone for two weeks, especially on the UFO front. Uh, so there's a lot here. We got to get to it. So let's go ahead and roll into the world wide web of weird. <laughs>
tonight on the World Wide Web of Weird. I thought we'd start off some UFO stuff. I think the first four or five are all UFO stuff. I feel like literally we've been gone and then there's a bunch of UFOs come out. I don't know. I mean, I've actually had people personally tell me recently uh, in my town of uh, Michigan City, Indiana, some co-workers and I've had, you know, people mention they've seen some UFOs too recently. I don't know what's going on. Maybe it's the fleet invading. I don't know. Don't ask to take us to our leaders because you don't want to. Trust me. Bad. For those listening on the Paranormal Soup Radio Network, we are a webcast. We're streaming out to Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch now. And I keep forgetting to put that in the uh, description of the show. We are on Twitch as well, if anybody uses that. Um, But yeah, you can watch us Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, or just listen as I narrate as best as possible on the radio network where you can just hear, you can't see, but it's all right. All right, let's go ahead and pull up the share screen here. All right, so this first one is a video. We'll just start out with a video right off the bat. UFO spotted during test flight in Santa Lucia. How do you say that? L-U-C-I-A? Is that, what do, you, do you know that place, Jamie? Santa Lucia? I don't know, airport. Repeated flying of objects sighting baffles experts. In a video, a disc-shaped UFO can be seen in the skies. It has made several people believe that the alien existence of Earth could be real. I mean, not one UFO sighting yet has confirmed that for everybody yet, and there's been billions, but it was around a few days back that an American Airlines pilot claimed to have spotted a cylindrical UFO, we remember we covered that, as the flight was traveling from Cincinnati to Phoenix. American Airlines confirmed the news of the UFO sighting and requested media outlets contact the FBI. Um, we all remember the story. The video that we're going to show is alleged event went viral after that clip. Uh, it was shared by popular conspiracy theorist Scott Waring. So this is from Scott Waring. In the video, a disc-shaped flying object can be seen through hovering in the skies as the flight is taking off. The eyewitness was watching a newscast about the first plane to land at San Lu- San- Santa Lucia Airport. I don't, I don't know. How, I'm not familiar with that one. He was watching because the Mexican Air Force was flying in the president of Mexico, Andres Ober, Oberdar. I don't know. But later in the ceremony, a non-military plane, white, was seen taking off from the runway. As this plane rose higher and higher upon taking off, a black disc could be seen hovering in its place in the background beyond the unfinished control tower. The eyewitness took off his camera and recorded directly off the TV screen, uh, wrote Wearing on his uh, website, UFO Sightings Daily. So you can find this at UFO Sightings Daily. Uh, this is Scott uh, Wearing's uh, one of his pieces of video here. So go ahead and let's take a quick look at this. Obviously, this is like he probably took the cell phone footage and stabilized it and zoomed in. It's just a one really short clip. I mean, in comparison, being off in the background and the plane there, I, it's, I don't think that could be a bird. That looks like it's huge. Am I wrong on that assessment? I don't I'm not think an expert it's a blimp. A blimp? Another plane? I don't know. Looks pretty big. It would be big. It would definitely be big. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. All right, Did let's move on. Did they ask air control about that or anything? If there's something in that airspace at that time? Not that I know of yet. Yeah, that's pretty trippy. I mean, with the president of Mexico, you think that uh, flying in the airspace has got to be pretty secure. But I don't know. All right, next one is mystery, mysterious object filmed in the skies of Wichita. Uh, this is Kansas. Residents reported seeing a vivid white object moving across the skies before disappearing. Wichita became the focal point of unexpected mass UFO sighting on Thursday after hundreds of people took to social media to report seeing something unusual in the sky. Photographs and video clips of the anomalous object indicated that it was a long white craft of some kind. I haven't seen any of the videos of it yet. I just had this article. I would like to see some videos of this. Um, uh, anomalous object indicated that it was a long white craft of some kind. However, so far, no conclusive explanation has been forthcoming. One of the most widely distributed videos of the UFO was recorded by Mike Mar- Marler. So I'm driving back to work, coming home from lunch. I noticed something in the sky really bright. It was surprising because we live in Wichita. We see airplanes all the time. Uh, we were near the airport, but it was definitely different. While some have suggested that the object could have been an advertisement plane, uh, you know, another blimp, uh, Marler remains unconvinced, especially due to the uh, peculiarities of its appearance and behavior. The rumors is it was an it was an Arby's advertisement plane, which you know logic would point to that, but it was really fast moving, it was really bright and vivid, and then it just disappeared. A news report featuring the footage can be viewed here. I didn't want it, it was off a news station, so I didn't use that footage, but on it, it does go by really fast. Not blimp, but it could it be something else that the camera's picking up. That my question is, you know, this guy saw it with his eyes, so it's not like a bug that did it to him. If he saw it with his eyes and recorded it, I'll, I'll trust the witness statement that it was up there. But you can go to Unexplained Mysteries. They have the link in there. Uh, it's at K-A-K-E 
Dot-com is the source for that video. I just couldn't use it, um, but check it out. All right, let's move on. We got a lot of UFO stuff, but I got an article at the end, non-UFO related, just to make you paranoid tonight. All right, man sees UFO emerge from portal over UK. This one I found really interesting. This is in the UK. A uh, parishioner from East Lancashire maintains that he saw something very unusual in the sky two weeks ago. The UK has been home to a great many UFO sightings over the decades. Uh, the light, latest one, which one has been described as like something out of a sci-fi movie, is one of the most intriguing to date. According to a report, 72-year-old Ian Gibbings from Colin Lancashire, Lancashire had been looking out of his patio window at around 6.30 p.m. on February 22nd when he spotted something strange in the sky. On a good night, Mars and Venus can usually be seen from where I live, he said. Uh, we got some great views out over the countryside, and on this particular night, the sky was clear and Venus had just appeared. I'm not into stargazing in a big way. I just like to look out the window and admire the sky. So I went to the patio and I had a look out the window, and a sudden UFO came out of a portal. It was red and orange and circular. I grabbed my binoculars and got a good view of it while we hovered over for a few seconds, but in the wink of an eye, it shot up in the sky and then sped off towards Skipton. As seen stand, it remains unclear exactly what the object could have been. It definitely wasn't a uh, plane or someone shining a light. I had a fantastic view of it. It was like something out of a sci-fi movie. So that was Lancash Lancashire, England. I I'm not telling you, I had to like cut more than in half the UFO stories tonight. There were so many in the last two weeks eyewitness reports different websites different people seeing stuff it's like something we, up we, we did one in las vegas there was north carolina i think i have that in here too yeah i think i got those two there's there's a ton so i mean are we i'd be interested tonight you know i mean we i want you to call in for the guests but if you haven't had seen a ufo in the last two weeks i'd love to hear about it uh because it seems like there's something picking up in the ufo like are we hitting a nationwide ufo or worldwide ufo wave i don't know but we got more we got more uh, hold on one second. My thing's messing up. All right. UFO. This is the one in Las Vegas. All right. So you guys talked about this one here. This MysteriousWire.com. UFOs over Las Vegas investigating, investigating mysterious lights by many. And I heard a lot of people talking about this on the on Facebook and that, seeing this. A uh, truly mysterious series of lights were seen by people in Las Vegas very, uh, Valley earlier this week. The lights are seen several videos and photographs appeared over Las Vegas, 7.30 p.m. Monday, March 1st. People on different sides of the city have reported seeing them. In the video and picture, you can clearly see four to eight lights. While hard to tell, most of the lights appear to be floating without much movement. Uh, again, I don't have a video on this one, but this is a picture they have from one of the videos. One witness to the spectacle was Melanie Smith. She lives on the fourth floor of a building a couple miles south of Las Vegas Strip. She says she saw the lights appear twice between 7.30 and 8.30. In her video, she is recording looking north. North, you can see seven lights at first, four grouped together to be the left of her view. Another light is seen lower than the others and two more to the right. So this is kind of a picture from that. Uh, in her second video, she notices an eighth light that appears only a few seconds. But as she says in the recording, it looks like it was on fire. Uh, another video posted on Twitter, the person who recorded this writes, it looked like the white lights were over Circa down Las Vegas, uh, down downtown Las Vegas. Mystery Wire contacted Circa and were told they had nothing to do with the lights in the sky. Uh, there's a, there's a multiple, multiple videos. I didn't want, you know, there's so many videos. I didn't want to make, put a video up this. You can go to mystery wire. They got several of the Twitter links to these, but this is one of the photos from the first story I was telling you about Las Vegas. I've never been there, but I, you know, I have friends that live there. I mean, there's a lot going on. I mean, they got, um, I mean, helicopter, uh, amusement rides there and they have all kinds of other stuff there. I know they've done, I know there's been flares and skydiver things that have happened there, uh, over the city. I mean, it could be debunked, but. Then again, I don't know. There's been a lot of UFO sightings in the last couple of weeks. There might be something to it. Do you have any takes on this, Jamie, since you guys covered this on uh, Wednesday's show? I just think it's really unusual. And, and the fact that we are seeing so many lights different places right now makes it really hard hard to say. But they said it wasn't event lightings. I've been yeah. to Vegas a few times, and I've seen a lot of weird stuff in Vegas, but I've never seen anything like this. <laughs> they look pretty bright. I mean, at yeah. this just this one picture shot, um, it look they look pretty bright. We played yeah. a video of it where there was actually I thought like two more lights even on the sides, and at first I thought it was his camera moving around. Do you still have the video I, of it? Yeah, I could see the buildings were actually still. But you could see it was like five lights and one to the side, one to the side, and it all moved like together. But it wasn't typical event or show lighting. It was it was yeah. different. And then it looked like it would like dim out and come back. But I'll see if I still have it and send that to you. 
see, you know, the the drone thing is always going to be the new suspect to all these things. Is it a drone? You know, or the drone somebody with drones? I mean, if they have know. to be like the blue angels <laughs> flying their. They look pretty big. Like They'd be pretty big drones, I would think, with the yeah, lights I mean, you see there. I've got some decent drones, and that those my drones never look like that in the night. Yeah, <laughs> that's a lot of wattage of light power there. I don't. Yeah. I mean, more. I would think more of the military, like you know like flares or something like that i don't they know. did bring up the flares but they they had reasoning why it was not that you know mm -hmm. like like i was saying wednesday when we were talking about this the the ones that i saw here you know last year or so the summertime at the beach at night looked just pretty much almost like this so yeah know. and what yeah. i saw wasn't chinese lanterns wasn't flares wasn't nothing it was something weird See, it's just like, I don't know, uh, being gone the last two weeks and just like trying to figure out how to do the World Wide Web weird with all these articles. I'm like, what do I cover? There's there's a bunch more. There's a bunch more. Like you said, there was what, North Carolina or South Carolina? Maybe both. Um, I know there is, I mean, there's so many I didn't cover on this. There's there's a, a ton of videos on YouTube right now of you. Oh, Shaquille O'Neal. That that one. I, go check that out. Shaquille O'Neal. I can't find now, it. I've been looking it, it, for it. It's on his Instagram. It's on his Instagram. I didn't, it came out yesterday. I didn't get time to add it to the World Wide Web weird or switch it out with something. Now, only thing I'll say, if you go to Shaquille O'Neal UFO sighting, this is the last UFO one I'm covering. we got a couple other stories we can get to. But if you go to the UFO thing for Shaquille O'Neal, he's driving in his car, and he doesn't really say much, but he's filming it with his cell phone. It's right over another bridge, like another overpass or something. So I don't know if it's a car with something sticking up above and he thinks it's a UFO. I don't know. But check it out. Shaquille O'Neal on Instagram has his own <laughs> UFO footage. I've seen another other celebrities lately, you know, maybe by a taco validate. truck. Yeah, I, I think this validates the you know theory we've always had that at times of war or you know um, elections, things like that. There's more sightings. I, I, my fear is if a bunch of UFO sightings are happening, we're gonna have some like major earth changing earthquake or something like that because there's evidence of them being curious and that stuff. Okay, we got to move on though. We're gonna run out of time. All right. Speaking of UFOs, and uh, one place we've covered a lot in the last year or two about UFOs, and I have a theory about it, uh, of why there's so many UFOs, there's Brazil, uh, and anything in the South America. But this isn't UFOs. This is two eight, uh, this, there's two photos of an ape creature surface in Brazil, sort of unexplained mysteries as well. Every country seems to have its own version of Bigfoot, and, and Brazil is no exception, as evidenced recently by rumors of a... Uh, Ape-like beast reported on the Iptaparcia Island. The stories are centered around uh, Ili D. Mis I'm not going to pronounce it. State of Baja, where a curfew is in response to the coronavirus pandemic has left residents restricted to their homes. This hasn't some stopped some strange stories from emerging. We've had a lot of these with people in lockdown. Uh, however, some of the report sightings of a peculiar ape-like creature wandering the des deserted streets at night. Most recently, two photographs of a circulating social media showing a creature walking along a quiet road, another which shows three creatures, two adults, and a juvenile. Um, they have very long arms, appear to walk upright on two legs by sight, slightly hunched over. What the images actually show, however, remains unclear. Could these simply be uh, native primates that have wandered into the streets due to the curfew? Is it also possible the images are a hoax? Uh, the first one is very well done because of the shadows, said the image of Francisco Particio. The animal is going to, against the light, and it's very straight in front of the animal. And in the second, it's very difficult to identify even the existence of a shadow because it's not illuminated. You, can, you can't tell if these are false or true. However, low resolution low resolution photos are perfect for optical illusions yes i don't know the the that one they're all both low resolution but the lighting's there it reminds me of that one we just did that had that childlike skinny creature remember going around that car well this is this is my deal this you know brazil what kind of primates do they have do they have chimpanzees, apes like this? Do, I don't know. I am not a. I'm not a Steve Irwin. I don't know the animals. Like a still. spider monkey with like. Yeah, extra or with long. like that would be my explanation for this. I mean, it's not big. It's not big at all. So that would be my explanation for what it is. It's kind of weird. But you know what? A reason I found this story interesting is that we've talked about ever since the lockdowns and everything is like, how does this affect the cryptid? creatures like do they go oh the humans are gone let's go take a look you know i've always i've been saying that for a while now that we might get more bigfoot or cryptid sightings because people have got you know the streets have gotten quieter and some of these towns are extremely locked down me just personally i'd rather like have a ufo fly over my head than see some whatever ape monkey alien cryptoid walking down the street like that because like i've said it before and i'll say it again monkeys and stuff freak me out so 
Yeah, well, snakes freak me out, Rob. So. Well, there you go. There you go. See? And I love both of them. See, I, I love I love primate monkeys. I remember that movie of Matthew Broderick where he changed the apes how to yep. fly planes. It made me cry in the theater, man. I, you know, snakes, I would not cry. All right, moving on, moving on. We're running out of time, man. Bigfoot uh, bounty, we've talked about this, about the legislation they tried to pass in what, uh, Oklahoma uh, to get like a Bigfoot hunting season. Well, that didn't happen, but there's been a lot of tourist activity happening because of that, uh, at least the, what they consider a lot in Oklahoma. Uh, but Bigfoot bounty now pa passes $2 million. I can't. I'm not going to read the whole article because we're going to run out of time, but they've gotten a number of donations uh, for a $2 million basically bounty. Uh, what was one of the corporations that put, I'm trying to find it, that put this money down, or I think it was a... A, f a filming group out of LA put like two million dollars down. Somebody can capture it alive, I bet which I like is alive. You know, not dead. They want it alive. Well, thank you. You know, let's not kill an endangered species because that's what it would be. But two million dollars, you might have better chances of uh, capturing Bigfoot alive than winning the lotto winning two million dollars. So there you go. I think that's going to be a mess. And I'll... <laughs> that's yeah. going to be a horrible mess Somebody's when things start. <laughs> yeah yes hopefully they're all using train guns or something since they want it alive all right might be really funny some hilarity i don't know oh yeah there's a youtube video coming all right last one before we run out of time and i wanted to get to this one because you know me and my paranoia and everything and uh i have all these horrible zombie dreams when <laughs> yeah and but a fascination with zombies and this new study comes out um uh, and there's a there's a movie on there they they totally don't mention in this that did this whole scenario with rabies but study finds that rabies could mutate into a zombie virus love love the media uh thanks to the coronavirus pandemic we all know how impactful a virus can be when it spreads from animals to humans but according to a new study from italy there's another virus that if modified or mutated in a certain way could bring about real life zombie apocalypse scenarios rabies is already known to spread from animals to humans through bites or scratches in many cases when someone is infected can cause them to become hyperactive and aggressive this in itself is a bit like what happens when someone is infected with, in the movies and turns into a zombie uh they become aggressive bite someone and you know yeah there's a movie out there i can't remember the name of it it's like one of those like what do you want to call it kind of like blair witch kind of filming movies uh but what if rabies was to mutate in such a way so that those who become affected behave much more aggressively and have tendencies to attack and bite other people such a scenario could be eerily reminiscent of a real life zombie apocalypse the fear of it is such that mutation doesn't occur naturally genetic engineering could produce a version of rabies that might cause those infected to act in this way there you go genetic engineering i'm just saying if it happens if i've said this so many times in the show if there is an actual real zombie virus it'd be our fault we made it it won't happen oh, naturally yeah. but i've also always wondered you know you uh the reason why we bury our dead i've always wondered like could there have been in the past maybe novel idea for our guest coming on uh, just joining the panel here uh how you doing, Bill? Maybe a novel idea for you is a uh, maybe we had the zombie virus way in the ancient past. Have Have you, you know? seen those grates that the, I just post on Instagram? They actually had these grids that they did put over the the graves that had these bars that went across in case they did come back to zombies. They wouldn't right. be able to come out of the ground. I mean, look at how much how much you know humans you know going way back put into like bury that thing they're dead. you know a fear of the dead you know maybe brain, there's a reason brain, 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 brain. <laughs> <laughs> i don't know it's a novel idea for you bill welcome to, to the show we're going to go to commercial break here in a second um but hey you know hey how you doing right. uh just talking about zombies and and uh you know somebody you know no ideas out there to you china but let's not mutate a virus <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, let's, you know, I swear these things give people you know, like, look, they, you know, China has named their uh, their social media AI system Skynet. <laughs> like, oh, this is a good they, idea, too. It's already there. Yeah. <laughs> They're trying to make genetically spirit humans. I mean, I'm just saying somebody's going to release the virus. I mean, I'm, I should I shouldn't brag on uh, knock on China because, you know, how our U.S. government's doing it, too. Oh yeah. In secret. You know we're doing it too. We're no we're no no better. But that's it for the World Wide Web Weird. Our guest tonight, Bill Donahue, author of Burn, Beautiful Soul. We're gonna be talking about demons. Oh yes, demons tonight. That always brings everybody. Come on, no, we're talking about the demons. Come on, people, come watch. It's the dark side. Oh yes. But it's gonna be a little bit of humorous pop culture about demons and what influenced Bill to write this book. And I like I said, I'm 15 chapters in, totally loving it, Bill. And we're gonna get into that tonight. All right, guys, we'll be right back.
Join us every Wednesday night at midnight Eastern Standard Time for Weird Wednesday at the live stream with your host Jamie, the Living Dead Girl, and Rob, the Phantom, where we'll talk about all things paranormal, including zodiac, astrology, tarot card and oracle card readings, live ghost boxing and spirit communication, where we'll do voices from beyond the cold case files. So we hope you join us live on Facebook and YouTube every Wednesday night at midnight Eastern Standard Time. We hope to see you there. Bye-bye. Since 1948, Fate Magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown, all of them true. Fate Radio is carrying on that tradition, bringing you the unusual, macabre, strange, and bizarre. Join host Cat Hops Sunday nights from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern on WBHM Digital Broadcast. of the second kind, physical evidence of a UFO, close encounters of the third kind, contact. From Steven Spielberg, the director of Jaws, comes one of the most ambitious and unusual films ever made, and what you will see has never been seen before. It's a cosmic mystery crossing what many scientists believe will be the next threshold of human experience. It's called Close Encounters of the Third Kind. It begins in an Indiana town and leads to one inescapable conclusion. We are not alone. Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Certificate A. Now showing at the Odeon Leicester Square. is alive. Join us and take a walk on the weird side when you tune in to the Kingdom of Nye, hosted by Heather Wade, the finest in late night talk. Listen live free weeknights starting at 9 p.m. Pacific time at thekingdomofnye.com, talkstreamlive.com, and the Paranormal Radio app. Wanna take a ride? The International Chart Topping, Haunted horror of Haverford West has been described as terrifyingly real, a must-read, shocking and chilling brilliance, genuinely worrying, utterly frightening. Don't read before bed. Described as one of the spookiest writers out there, best-selling author G.L. Davies presents Haunted Horror of Haverford West, the true paranormal account that is shocking the world. Dare you enter, dare you read. Haunted Horror of Haverford West is available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Kindle, and wherever books are sold. Pray you never have to live there. Do you like rock and roll? Do you enjoy a good story? Wish You Were Here, A Rock Fantasy, is a book inspired by Badfinger. It will not only entertain you, but intrigue you. What is it about? While Thomas is searching for his bandmate and friend in heaven, and in spirit has helped pen this story, he meets an old friend and famous new ones on his afterlife voyage. Midwest Book Review said, Wish You Were Here, A Rock Fantasy, is a book inspired by Badfinger. It's a quirky story by Joyce S. Isaacson, and his unique, original, and deftly crafted metaphysical novel that showcases the author's genuine flair for character and narrative-driven entertainment that is simply riveting from first page to last. Wish You Were Here, A Rock Fantasy is now available on pennantpublication.com, amazon.com in paperback and hardcover, and also on Kindle Unlimited. 
So check it out now. Wish you were here. A rock fantasy. Switch to DCS ranging. 240, nominal to profile. We're in the pipe. Five by five. <laughs> Tonight on Paranormal Soup, our guest is William J. Donahue. He's the author of Burn, Beautiful Soul. William Donahue works as a full-time magazine editor and feature writer. Currently, he is the editor of three monthly lifestyle publications serving as the greater Philadelphia area, area, as well as associate manager editor of the literary journal about the writers, artists, and history of Bucks County. He's a writing and reporting to have earned multiple awards for excellence in business and journalism, both print as digital. Burn, Beautiful Soul is available from Cosmic Egg Books and from wherever books are sold. Of course, Amazon, you get it there, but, you know, go to a website. Screw Amazon. Uh, do you believe in D? Demons are real. That's what we're going to talk tonight. You know, we're going to talk about what influenced Bill uh, to write this book, his personal experiences. Like I said, anybody growing up in Pennsylvania has definitely run into something paranormal there. I, everybody I know <laughs> has, has so many stories. Uh, he's also authored other books we might get into talking about tonight. It's Too Much Poison, Brain Cradle, Filthy Beast. I, I, like, I like these titles. They all sound really interesting. But I'm 15 chapters into this book, loving it. I, I purposely, with fiction books, don't like to finish them before the guests come on the show because I don't want to give anything away. I want you to go out there and check it out. But it's going to be a good show. We'll open up the phone lines after the next commercial break. So let's go ahead and get to our guest. Welcome to the show, Bill. It's wonderful to have you on. Appreciate you guys having me. How are you doing? Really good. Uh, re really quick, Rob, I just added, I forgot to put it in there. I did put the cover of his book in there if you want to bring it up to share here in a little bit. Um, but it's the first time we've had you on the show. Uh, like I said, I'm 15 chapters in. Uh, <laughs> I'm like trying to like, is this a comedy? This is really good, but it's really dark. Like the first the first page of this book, I'm like, no, not, not a comedy. Like, but then later on, I don't know, like you really go to, I just, I don't want to give anything too much away, but the, the very first page of this book, I'm like, wow, you just show the darkest sides of humanity with the first like two paragraphs. It looks pretty, pretty ugly side of humanity. Uh, but the character of Basil, he's a demon or demon king, uh, who works his way out of like, I guess, hell, you know, whatever this is, or they, for the, forgot the name he did give it. They don't call it hell. Um, but wants to experience what it's like on on the top side, and I, I find it interesting. I don't like to give too much away, but he goes into advertising. I'd love to get into that a little bit later. <laughs> why, is that, why is that? It's a perfect job for demons. My wife went for marketing. I don't know, uh, but you know, tell us a little bit about yourself. You know, you know what got you into writing, and what led you down the course of writing a book about a, a demon kind of anti-hero. Uh, for me, in my background. Uh... I actually started in all things uh, electrical engin engineering. That was kind of where I started things, but I quickly realized that uh, I did not have the brain for that. So I, I went into advertising and marketing. Um, I wondered, which, read, I was like reading the book. I'm like, this guy had to have done an advertising job. He, he must have hated it. Go absolutely. I, I, yeah, we can talk about that. I did hate it. Um, <laughs> but then I, I was doing some ghost writing on the side and eventually got a job full time with a with a magazine uh, writing about business of all things. Uh, but, uh, you know, always writing other things on the side that actually really interested me. So, um, you know, everyone has experiences that, that leads them down different paths. I thought I would be doing something much different than a writer. I thought I would be a professional hockey player or a musician or yeah, uh, yeah, the musician thing. I thought I'd be doing that. That's a long time. My early teenagers and bands and, you know, probably up until about the time I got married. I'm like, yeah, this ain't going to happen. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah, I, I, was... I'm still trying. <laughs> yeah, kind of, I think. Kind of... I think uh, all of us have friends that uh, I have a few friends that are still doing it. And uh, actually, the, the band that we started back in 1990 is still alive to this day. Really? Um, so it's, it's, it's pretty amazing. I, I give these guys so much credit for, for doing it. Um, I mean, obviously, things are, are a little bit different right now, but um, uh, it certainly does give you some different perspective that you wouldn't have gotten otherwise. What, what kind of band was it? Uh, hardcore punk. 
<laughs> so like myth, misfits kind of thing or like uh, uh, what were you kind of doing like well we started off as more of a metal band but we also had we had uh we, so we were kind of a crossover band i would say more kind of like chrome egg something like that so obviously you didn't like sacrifice a virgin to like get a record deal or anything <laughs> <laughs> like uh, a Jennifer's no. body. You guys should have. You made it far, right? Everybody's Not wearing my time with band now. <laughs> well, you know, I, I find, you know, like I said, I did, I was an, uh, a musician in that. I've tried to be a writer and I'm not, I'm trying to get back into it. So I really am enjoying your style of writing. It, 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 it's a, a style that I very much, it's very similar to how I write. And that's why I'm kind of enjoying it. It's helped me, giving me confidence to like to get back into it. I, I love the way you, um, your imagery is nasty and as dirty and as foul as it gets in it. It's really good. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate you it. You don't hold back. You don't hold back. And that's what I like about that kind of writing. But um, so, I mean, you grew up in Pennsylvania, right? All your life or? I spent some time in Chicago, about three years. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I was born in, in Philadelphia. Um, right now, I live about 90 minutes outside of Philly. Um, but uh, so Philadelphia, of course, has a ton, like you said, has a ton of um, paranormal hotspots. Uh, we live right on the border of Bucks County. Uh, Bucks yeah. County is, it's got a ton of, of things. And uh, that was pretty much when I was coming up and I was a teenager, every weekend we would go off and, ex and explore these places that uh, it was back then there were really, when I was a teenager, the internet wasn't really a thing yet. So it was just, <laughs> yeah. hand, it was just handed down uh, legends that you would hear. It was before and, the ghost hunting TV shows too, right? So. Ab absolutely. Yep. Yep. Uh, so, I mean, you were interested in the paranormal or, you know, did you have experiences as a child or a teenager that like, you know, imprinted on you like, yeah, I'm going to write a book about a demon later in life. I, I like a lot of kids. I think it started with a couple of uh, horror films that uh, and violent mm -hmm. cartoons, things like that. But uh, so I grew up in, in northeast Philadelphia. Uh, we lived in a neighborhood called Millbrook and uh, that the experiences I had there are things that that it got me thinking about this kind of stuff. So we li we lived there till I was probably 13 or 14. And this is in the, in the eighties in the early to mid eighties. And it was honestly, it was when people think about Philadelphia, they think about, you know, where Rocky lived and stuff like that. Right. But where we lived, it was really pretty idyllic. It was the closest you could get to the suburbs um, without actually living in the suburbs. So, um, so when I was probably nine or 10 years old, and I may be getting the timing wrong because my sister and I had different recollections of this, but it seemed like during the course of one summer, like all this crazy stuff happened. Um, like first there was a, there was a sexual assault in the woods down the street. Ooh. But at the time I, I had no idea what rape Whoa. was. I just, I knew right. that someone gotten hurt and uh, someone needed to get punished for that. Uh, then there was a, a grisly murder. Um, it was actually the mother of a classmate of mine. Then oh um, a neighbor's baby died. And then to cap it off, uh, someone vandalized the church. Uh, the church was maybe 500 feet from our front door. So following wow. the, the vandalization, uh, someone actually tried to burn down the church. Uh, oh, yeah. So they, they caught that person eventually. But so when you're nine or 10 years old, all this stuff is happening and none of it makes sense because no one really wants to talk about it. No, no one yeah. wants to tell you about it. So you're, you're innocent, and, but you slowly realize that uh, you know, the world isn't all flowers and sunshine. Like I said, your first, your first, first page of your book, I'm like, whoa, like, <laughs> like you take, like, I don't know if it is it the demon kind of seeing images from the world. That's the only part I was like, when I'm reading it, like, so it's like, seems like this imagery is coming in, like to see this scene, it's really bad. And he goes to another scene, they're like, oh yeah, this is just humanity. And it's, it's brutal finest. It seemed like a little opinion of humanity like mine, <laughs> but a little, a lot of bad things out there. Uh, but, um, in PA, you know, you, you had these experiences. I mean, let, let's get into this. I mean, you wrote a fictional story about a demon, and obviously, you went with a physical demon in this in this book. It, it's like this picture. Let me pull the the, um, the show this here. This is the cover of the book, "Burn Beautiful Soul." So it's a black skinned demon, physical. It, it poops. You get plenty of pooping scenes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's funny though um i mean it's a physical demon all the demons in this like underground world are like physical creatures uh in the paranormal world being an investigator that generally not how that how it how i generally come across most people's belief in demons what what made you want to choose it to like go with this kind of physical route like with a demon a uh, great question so uh yeah we, exactly we tend to think of demons as these uh kind of incorporeal beings that yeah. never walk the world never walk the earth uh, it's something like uh, it's like fighting smoke, uh, something like that. So to me, that idea is just horrifying. 
Um, the possession I, I will, part. The possession part and just the fact that this thing can possibly make your life a living hell. And uh, I've yeah. talked to a few people, uh, know a few people that said they have had these kind of experiences. And they're just, uh, one of them in particular just stays with me. And I just, I and I, I, I would consider myself someone who doesn't, I, I, I'm kind of split worlds between how I feel about the, this phenomenon. <laughs> but um, so part, part of me, it's, I think, finding it is very terrifying. The idea of something that you can't see or touch is terrifying. So part of me, I, I wanted to create this, this creature that um, I could see, you could see or touch, something that is not, uh, not immortal, something that is not, um, right. not undefeatable. Um, so, and to be honest with you, I wanted to create something. I mean, Basil, the, the main character, he's a terrible person. He's done absolutely horrible things, but well, there's a also, demon. he's a demon. <laughs> But he's also got a lot of humanity in him, and, and that, to me, made him interesting. He's a poet. <laughs> he is a poet, yes. <laughs> the interview, there's a part in the book I really love when he goes into the, uh, um, there's the uh, get work at the unemployment office. <laughs> and he's like, well, I like, po you know, I'm a poet. You know, <laughs> like, yeah, you're going to need more than that on your resume. We'll, we'll get into it. I don't give, like I say, give too much away on it. But um, so... You know, going with the physical demon, I mean, demons have been part of culture. We can get a little bit about the culture, maybe how this influenced you. I mean, we've had lots of guests on this show talk about real life demons. And I mean, they affect we can. It's good to make humor. That's why I do the, the show the way I do. We do hum, make humor out of a lot of things, but I do take it seriously. I'm a paranormal investigator. I take demonic infestations that people claim happening very seriously. I had my shadow person experience or hat man, and it was serious. Like it, it made me always a believer to listen to anybody else and their experiences when they say they've been you know, their demonic possession or there's something dark or something evil i've i've had it happen to me so i will listen to anybody who says it's happened to them yeah. um I, I i'm agnostic i don't belong to i'm not christian even though I, i've read the bible and all that so i don't follow any line of religion but i do believe there's an existence of something after my shadow person experience maybe that was demonic i don't know i believe there are real entities that do affect people in, in many different ways we don't understand are you a believer in demons or you know do you have a religious background that kind of guides you in that i was raised catholic um like you i'm i would say i'm agnostic now i i want to believe in the idea of of something after and all that kind of stuff uh i'm just not sure i do uh i would say as in regard to demons i never really gave the idea too much thought um in the course of of, of uh, doing some fact finding for this book uh, talking to people that have had these experiences, reading up on what are supposed to be actual demons. Um, th I would say that there is the, the the practical, rational side of me that says, you know, there, there's really nothing to worry about here. Uh, but then there's this other part of me, this primitive kind of reptilian brain part of me that, that says, you know what, uh, be careful. Fear of the dark shadow, you know, right. fear of the darkness, you know, but you, the, the, I think there's something there because I felt that way until I was 17 and I ran across something <laughs> that followed me home and tortured me and dro almost drove me to the brink. Wow. So that's why I'm always a lever. That's the thing. It's hard for people to believe when they haven't experienced it, you know, and I get that. I, I understand that. I, I'm agnostic about everything else, too. I mean, mm -hmm. I still don't know what what I experienced. I'm, I'm hard to like a shadow person, hat man, demonic, alien even. I don't know. I, I, it's hard for me to label something. I don't have any comprehension. I just know it was evil. Right. <laughs> Whatever it did, it was up to no good. Uh, you know, demon. We've had. Um, oh, well, I'm trying to think the guest's name I had on. Um, archaeologist. She talked about you know demons going way before Christianity. I mean, they were part of everyday life in so many different cultures and religions. And I mean, the Sumerians had a demon for every. They even had a toilet or poop demon. You know, like there was a demon for everything. Yeah. Did you use any kind of like? Did you kind of stick to the Catholic demon thing, or do you use anything from like other sources or other religions for your your idea to create your kind of like demonic world? So I, for a lot of uh, you mentioned that the place that he's from, they they call it our fiery home, and it, it, it is a lot like what we would think of traditionally as hell. Um, right. I did incorporate some elements of. Um, what you would call like things that are pulled from like the like the ancient grimoires about about actual demons um about things like uh like sigils and signs and uh and the importance of names um so that kind of stuff i did pull in but i i wanted to like you said at the, at the beginning you know basil and the race that he leads these are corporeal figures that they're they're flesh and blood as far as we know um so in that sense i, I wanted to make something different 
Now, uh, what is to you? I mean, you say you've you've had some a little bit of experiences living in Pennsylvania. You know, tell tell me about experience you had that. I mean, even though you question everything, but made made you question the idea that oh, there really could be something evil or dark or an afterlife. What, what's some of your personal experiences have led you to kind of believe that there's a chance there could be a demonic world? So. Again, Bucks County's got a ton of places that uh, that you could go and investigate, and there are some absolutely fantastic stories. And we get into some of those that they're just they're they're terrific. Um, but I've I've had a few experiences just going to places. One actually, the one that that sticks with me um, was not in Pennsylvania; it was actually on the Florida Georgia border. And um, I'll try to make it as brief as possible. But essentially, this is when I was uh, I was a business reporter and I was going down meeting with this company and 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 they said, well, you know, I was just going to get a hotel room. And they said, no, you can stay at our um, it was an old plantation house, apparently. So it had been around for just, you know, probably 200 years or so. And um, so I said, you can just stay there. So they pick me up at the airport. I don't have a car. They pick up the airport. And uh, so during the course of dinner, they start telling me about this place, this place I'm going to be staying. And they're talking about how haunted it is and, and how they found all this stuff in the sub basement. And uh, right out back, there's just uh, there's a, a whole bank of just alligators just lining, uh, lining the bank. It's just a creepy feel. And they're, they're freaking me out during dinner and uh, they're, they're driving me back to this place. And uh, there's no lights anywhere, no neighbors. There's a Spanish moss hanging down from the trees, just really creepy. So they drop me off, they open the door and they say, good luck. That so I was like, oh, you gotta be kidding me. So I, I, I'm <laughs> thinking I'm not sleeping the whole night. I'm just gonna watch TV and hopefully I'll fall asleep in a chair. So I'm doing that for a good 10, 15 minutes and all of a sudden the TV goes dead and then the mm -hmm. lights go out. And so I, I'm, just, I'm, I'm just like standing in this house and just kind of freaking out. And all of a sudden I hear this loud noise upstairs it's like it sounded like someone dropped a bowling ball on the floor so i essentially ran out of the house and i'm standing on this porch in the middle of nowhere with i'm I sure i had a cell phone but this is back in the, probably the early to mid 2000s but um and i'm like what the hell do i do i, I do i there's no neighbors there's uh, i don't have a car and uh i was faced with sleeping out on the porch or going back inside oh, wow. so i eventually went back inside and i slept on top of a bed on the first floor uh, I, i'm sure if that that was kind of that was the end of the weird stuff but it just i just remember feeling so unwelcome i'm like it just and it could have been purely my imagination but it was just in a it was just a really long night i bet i mean did you ever get power back or the tv back no no oh, not <laughs> so till you are late in the dark they came on they came the next morning and uh I don't remember what they, they said, but it was just one of those experiences that just like, I, I'll, I'll always remember it. Oh, wow. I mean, I've, I've known like experiences, you know, there's always local haunts in your town that people are saying, oh, this is haunted, the, the urban legends. What were some of the urban legends like in your hometown that you, you had, like any good stories, ghost stories in your hometown? The best one I can think of is um, probably the, the, the White Knight of Holocom. And uh, again, this is one of the stories that was passed down um, just from friend to friend, things like that. Um, so Holocong is a place in Bucks County. It's this very rural, very fairly remote place, especially mm -hmm. this is probably 20 years ago. And uh, there's a place there. It's called Gravity Hill. I know there are other ah, places like that around the country. I got one here. There you I go. Gravity Hill here. I used to go to it all the time when I was a teenager. Watch people drive their cars up the hill and the ghost is pushing it. Yeah, no. Absolutely. But yes, we had it. So we had one of those. And at the top of the hill, there's a church. And um, you're told when, when you're 16, 17 years old that this is a satanic church. And the windows oh, are painted black. In the and 80s, the, right? In the 80s, yeah. And the headstones face the wrong way and all that kind of stuff. Um, I did research after the fact. I think it's just a Baptist church. But um, <laughs> so there is one gravestone um, in or one grave in this, in this um, cemetery next to the church. And it's lined with a cage, and that that part is true. So, uh, from the from what I remember from what we talked about when we were kids, it was like that person, whoever was buried there, had been possessed by a demon or something, and was now buried, you know, beneath the ground, and, and the cage was there to keep him him in place, everything in 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 place. But the the legend is that um, you go up to this gravestone and you say, "I challenge the White Knight," 
and then this you know apparition appears and races you out of the cemetery some people say it's the actual devil himself um so you race out of the cemetery if you get there first you get to live and if you don't then you die within say seven days That's so it's a cool legend but the really interesting part is when i was a senior in high school um there was a kid who was a year younger than me. His name was Fred. I'll use just his first name. Yeah. And he was uh, at a party and doing, and they were doing things that, that teenagers do, um, huffing butane. Oh, so that's great. He's like huffing butane and then, you know, light a match and blow it out like a dragon, something like that. Yeah. So he did that and it went horribly wrong and oh. he died. And that part is absolutely true. So, what someone had said after the fact was that he had been to that graveyard a week before and had challenged the white knight and lost. So I don't know if that last part of it is true, but that uh, that's something that is, has endured for, I mean, that was 20, 25 years ago and, and I still hear it. <laughs> well, you know, I find it interesting. I've always been fascinated by the gravity Hills because I had one, you know, here in, uh, in Michigan city, Indiana, we have a gravity Hill. I actually, you know, like one of the weirdest, I mean, I've had, I've seen a lot of talk about on the show. One of the weirdest things, though, I did see. I have to say, this has got to be my top weird things was at Gravity Hill. Now, most of these Gravity Hills that people like do, if you have a Gravity Hill in your little town, most of you know it's an optical illusion. It, you know, you think the car's going uphill, but if you actually go out there and survey it, you'll find that it's an actual incline. It looks like you're going uphill, but you're not. And I, I don't know if a lot of these scenes started, you know, from I, I'm 41, going to be 42. I don't know how old you are. But, you know, we were 80s and 90s. I think a lot of this got popularized by um, the sightings TV show. You remember that? They did like the whole, they did the Texas, I think it was in Texas, the the, the most famous one, where they get pushed over the train tracks hmm. and all that. I I, I don't know they if that influenced it, but... That. But, but, well, yeah, they, they, again, the incline, but then again, I find people, I found people in my hometown are like, oh, we were doing that. Gravity Hill has been around longer than that. It's been around 40, 50 years or more uh, going back. So I don't know how that, it's like the um, La Llorona, you know, it's like mm. one of these urban legends that's in every different parts of the country. So I always find those fascinating, how they start and how, how, why we have these, like the hook man, you know, like these similar legends in all these towns like did they, so this could be the perfect hill we're gonna make this one gravity hill for that legend you know like how does that happen well i was out on my gravity hill not related to the we were going to do the whole going up a hill thing and then we changed our mind there's too much traffic and we're riding back it was me and three other people the girls driving my friend uh um megan's driving i have my other friend chris in the front seat my friend zach to my left and i'm behind chris and i could see this hand come into the window like right in front of me it was like a translucent blue hand wispy hand and zach was one of the most skeptical people sitting right next to me he's like what comes in right in front of me and my friend megan could see it in the rearview mirror come into the car at me and it's just like this hand it came in and she's like slammed on the brakes like what was that and we took off and she's like i'm never going back again you know, I was one, I've had a lot of weird stuff, but the, the, the hand coming through the window of a moving car, I don't know what that was. I don't, you know, even though I've debunked Gravity Hill, there was, a, we all saw strange lights out there. So part of me wonders if it's like a Topa thing, like the Tibetan mm. thought form, like everybody thinks it's haunted, or all, everybody in town knows Gravity Hill's haunted, or there's something weird there, so weird stuff happens. I don't Ours know. Ours out here is between two of the power plants, and so I think that that has something to do with it. Oh, well, there was no power plants here, but I mean, it's always some remote little, little, little bit remote location. Usually mm -hmm. these gravity hills be interesting to document all the different urban legends of gravity hill. I mean, I even had a band here named that I was, I used to play shows with named their album gravity hill. I mean, like that's how well known it was around here. So it's interesting. You also had a gravity hill in your town. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. We had a, uh, there was a green ghost and you mentioned the Tulpa. I, I always wonder if it was something like that. I forget what the source was, but we were at some remote location and you just park on the side of the road and the green ghost is supposed to appear and come toward you. And uh, really? we all saw it at the same time. And it was just, uh, it, it was just curious. Uh, and we were always, we were of course trying to explain it. We, we couldn't, um, but uh, it was, it was curious. What do you mean a green ghost? Like you saw a green ghost or we, a green something? We, yeah, we saw a green figure. Uh, essentially, we were parked in the car for a good hour in this in this road, and, and we were pretty much about ready to leave. 
And all of a sudden we saw this thing appear. It looked bipedal and it looked like it was walking toward our car. Uh, we got freaked out and turned our lights on and, and that kind of and ruined everything. Yeah. But, uh, I, but I still, still can't explain it. I, I meant I should, I should go back and, and research it and see what that was all about. But at the time it was just one of those weird things. Oh yeah. I mean, like I said, I've seen a lot of, re- I mean, anybody mentions something green, they see, I goes back my first paranormal experience, like my first like memory of something that I knew right away was abnormal was when I was four or five years old with my cousin, we saw a green floating head hmm. come flying through the room we were in. So I hear anybody say something green. I'm like, Hmm, what is that? Cause it was the glowing green head that <laughs> floated through the room and screamed at us or screamed at me. At least he didn't hear the screaming, but I could, it's wow. really weird. So yeah, you've had a lot. You've had a lot to influence you to get into this. So did you start out like kind of writing horror, or what, what, what's your forte of writing? Uh, initially, it was probably uh, the, like the first novel I wrote. Um, it was kind of a Jaws knockoff. So I guess it was uh, it was more. I, I love cryptids. I love snakes. I love sharks. Ooh. I love all that kind of stuff. Um, so that influenced me pretty strongly. So the first one was was very derivative of, of Jaws. Um, then I. I I did some straight horror and things like that. And then I got into things like uh, John Updike and John Irving and things like that. And and I got more into character driven stuff. But uh, so John Updike, I I kind of, I would love to someone say I was the John Updike of horrors or something like that. But um, (laughs) yeah. Well, I, I'll never remember in creative writing. I had a teacher who was obsessed with Jaws, the novel. <laughs> like she's like, she thought it was the best writing. And I not the first Jaws novel was great, but she made us write read, read the Beast. Remember the sequel? Or like it's kind of not sequel, but you know, like the next book. And I'm like, this is garbage. I did not like it at all. Uh, but you know, Jaws' original novel is really good. Yeah, really good. Interesting story. Actually, the the first book that I read for enjoyment was Beast. <laughs> <laughs> i hated it i hated yeah. it maybe because i don't maybe i just i was like i love jaws and i just didn't like the beast and then they tried to make it a horrible sci-fi movie it was awful yeah. it but, was uh, the yeah, same but, it was the same book just a squid rather than a shark it was yeah. it was so bad <laughs> in my opinion i mean maybe it's just the the cynic in me i don't know but like my english teacher hated me I, like she she's like i was when i criticized her love of the beast <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was a really hard time the rest of the year in that class she just loved that book <laughs> It's funny. That's the first book that really got you into it. Yep. Um, so you, you know, so yeah, you've written other books like uh, Too Much Poison, Brain Cradle, Filthy Beast. Are those all like in the kind of horror genre or what are uh, what, you, what have you written? Oh, uh, yes. The first two, Brain Cradle and Filthy Beast, they're more horror. Um, too Much Poison, I, I kind of call that my um, my nervous breakdown book. But <laughs> um, yeah, they're all they're all in the the horror, dark urban fantasy genre. So what what was the original thing that got you to kind of come up with this story of this demon? What, what you write about a demon as your main character? Um, it started as uh, at the time I had been reading a lot of Christopher Moore. Uh, Christopher Moore is a, he's a really good writer. He writes cross genres, but he's um, he's very he writes humor very well. And uh, I had read a book called The Lust Lizard of Melancholy Cove. Um, and for some reason I had, uh, I know at the beginning we were talking about the, the Satan character from South Park, but, um, oh, yes. I had this image of this, um, character very much like the Satan character from South Park, just in a white button down t-shirt with like a bolo <laughs> tie working in office, fixing copiers. And, uh, that was the initial image that I had. And, um, again, that was probably 15 years ago. And I, I didn't know what the story was. Um, right. But I knew I wanted to do something with that character. Well, I told you, I, I told him this before the show. I didn't know if I was going to say it on air, but when I'm reading the book, I, I keep hearing the the, the ba- Basil's voice as like the Satan from South Park. I don't just kind of what I picture a little bit. You know, he's got black skin, not the red skin. Like right, it's like the description of the book. He's got black skin, but the the way the the way he comes out, the way that he kind of is, and he's especially in the beginning because you start out, uh, he's in this uh, the our fiery home or hell. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he rules over everybody. And it just kind of reminded me that, you know, Satan's depressed, <laughs> depression in hell in South Park. I think that's what influenced me to hear that voice. Cause that's the voice I keep hearing when he's talking the book is <laughs> the Satan from hell in yeah. South Park. And you know, I'm just waiting for Saddam to pop in, <laughs> <laughs> but it's not, I'm not, it's, it's a compliment because I, it is very, I guess it's cause I am finding humor in the darkness. Cause there's, like I said, the first very first page of this book you kind of take people through like this tour of the horrors of humanity before you go to hell 
Yeah, I, to be honest with you, it's a great point that you mentioned the humor, and uh, I think some people don't know quite what the like. Uh, some people don't know quite what to make of that. Um, but I see. I mean, I look at at life, and and life is even you know horror novels. I mean, life is even a horror novel. It can be horror. It can be horror. It can be terrible. But there's also there also has to be moments of of levity, of romance, of tedium, of humor. So yeah. to me, I I didn't think that was that big of a stretch. And and when you have an eight foot tall coal black um, demon living among humans, it's it's just absurd. So it just invites humor. Well, one of the things is, is when he finally, I don't like I said, I don't give too much away, but when he does get out of hell, it's like pretty much the humans are like, oh, it's a demon. Okay. You know, except for the really Christian people are like throwing stuff at him. But otherwise, most be so why did you take that take? Like you could have done it, gone a, several different ways with a demon walking out into the world. Why did you take the take of humans being like, oh, yeah, this is acceptable for a demon to walk around naked? Uh, it, it just made sense. Um, if we <laughs> look, look at the world and like that's why I think that the you mentioned the opening chapter about all the terrible things uh, that people do and people have done. So to me, that. It, it what didn't seem too much of a stretch because uh, we we see we think about demons and demons are associated with just absolute uh, abhorrent things, um, but humans do abhorrent things every day. So right. it, uh, it to me it 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 wasn't much of a stretch. Well, I, speaking of South Park Satan, there's one scene, one of the episodes where, where he's like, I really don't have to do anything anymore. Humans are doing a pretty good job all on their own. <laughs> <laughs> that's basically like the gist I feel like in the in this novel. It's like he's bored because he doesn't have to do anything. We're we're doing just fine on our own, creating evil in the world. Right. So um, you know, in that you know, so he let, let's talk a little bit of your vision of of hell. You, you talk about like uh, you know these kind of different like imp creatures and all like there's like fighting and it's just like fiery pits of lava. What what created your vision of hell? Like, you know, what what made you decide to make it like it is in the book? Um, I just I thought of a place that uh, that he I mean, essentially, he's escaping um, and he's uh, Basil is again, he's 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 done horrible things. Um, but at his heart, um, he's he doesn't really necessarily want to be. So I thought of a place that he wanted to escape. And uh, I mean, the things that he sees down there it, it's i mean there's cannibalism there's torture there there is rape um it's just really awful um so I, again it's it's i see it as as an escape um i mean there are there are some tropes of of what we think of as hell in terms of just the, there's a there's a lake of blood that may be a little bit different yeah um but uh i, I just i thought of something very unpleasant and um to me, I could I could kind of see and smell it and and taste it. <laughs> yeah, you, you do. You get into the sensory is pretty good. At, uh, hell, it's not a pleasant place. But what I wondered when, when reading that, you know, uh, your description of hell and all that, you describe the demons. Like, are there human souls in hell? Like, how does that work in your 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 world? I mean, are human souls going to this hell, or how does that work? I may be giving a bit. Too That's what much. I want. Okay, I'm afraid. That's what I was afraid of. Okay. Because I'm reading it and I have a hint and an idea of where you might be going. So I don't. All right. We'll stop there because there, there's an interesting aspect to this. Go read B Burn Beautiful Soul. I don't want to give it away. Okay. I was afraid I might because I'm 15 chapters in and I might be giving it away to myself because I have a theory about that. Okay. I want to stop uh, there. I'll say this. It's different. That we, we think of, like you said, you think of uh, the Christian hell in terms of, you know, you're the cells are going to, the human souls are going to, you know, boil in pits of lava and things like that. This is different than, than what we traditionally think of as, as the Christian version of hell. It reminds me a little bit of, were you a fan, a fan of Todd McFarlane? Uh, you know, Spawn? Spawn, yep. Okay, okay, okay. I get an idea. I got an idea. <laughs> Which I love Spawn. Like, it's one of my mm -hmm. favorite comic book series. And, uh, you know, not the movie, though. Oh, God, not the movie. Mm. <laughs> the, 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 the actual cartoon movie is way better than the PG-13 movie they made. But spawn big big fan of and that's what i kind of thought of in your book is the with the demons and imps and stuff like that I'm like hmm so yeah don't want to give that away if anybody's a spawn fan they might be getting where i'm thinking it might be heading with why are there no humans because you'll kind of notice there's no humans I, souls or people being tortured it's demons torturing demons like they're all brutal to each other it's not a, it's not a good place now now uh basil 
uh, what influenced you to uh, put him in the advertising? We've talked a little bit, but I, I, I kind of know the answer to this, but I want to talk about it. You put him in the advertising world. Like he goes to the unemployment office and he finds his way into an advertising job, which I told my wife this and she was laughing because she went to school for marketing and advertising. And uh, she, didn't, she ended up doing that. But <laughs> I told her that she's like, that would be a perfect job for a, a demon. <laughs> Yeah, so I mentioned it at the outset, but uh, yeah, I worked in advertising for uh, probably about three years at the beginning of my career. Um, I, I just mentioned something was the other day, but I learned to, to get yelled at really well there. Um, it's uh, it's it's an interesting it's an interesting place an advertising agency because it's 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 they're typically run by small businesses and um, you meet a lot of interesting people at, at these places. They're kind of like their own little ecosystems. And um, Basil, as you said, he's a, he's a poet or a wannabe poet. And he kind of wants to write the world alive with his, his fancy words. Um, so he finds himself writing copy, like just boring copy about tractors and, and things like that. It's not exactly what he had in mind, but he, 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 he puts his own unique spin on it, but right. to me, it just seemed like a really good place for him to be. Like I said, I'm only 15 chapters in on it, but um, I, I find the, uh, I, I'm wondering if you based uh, his boss off of a real person with the dislike there, the way that his boss is with him. Uh, when he, The fact that he, somebody's hiring a demon is hilarious to me. The interview is <laughs> hilarious in the book, uh, but they, they even keep him on when the Christians are at the door with fork picks, you know, and stuff like that. <laughs> So I, I, a lot of different aspects, a lot of different places. I'm curious where it's going to go reading this book. But um, what 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 intrigued you? What you you know, you said you had this idea, this vision, you know, years ago of a demon working in an office. What 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 what, what do you think influenced that vision? Like to get uh, seeing it. What made that funny to you? Uh, it just I guess it gets back to the absurdity because you have someone who's 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 evil um, and just how is that person going to to interact with humans who are used to playing by rules and being civilized um, some of his early his early early interactions with with humans and his suggestions for solving problems are, are just completely ridiculous um, <laughs> he he ultimately finds his way because he, he learns that there are rules and and he kind of learns that the way that he is tradition, he the way that he has lived his life below ground, may not be the best way to do things. So, uh, I, I think he tries to to moderate himself a little bit and uh, and to learn some lessons and and maybe not be such a such a bad guy. Now, did you feel like kind of daunting to have character development for a demon? Not really. Um, I, I I thought he. He kind of wrote himself. Um, I know that sounds really kind of cheesy, but um, just again, when you have um, when you have human characters, not I mean, you can, you can have some human characters. They're absolutely terrible and there are terrible human characters in this book. Um, but showing those two things side by side, I think, really highlights the 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 points of character in in. in Two yeah, the humans are, are worse than, than him. The humans exactly. are worse than him. Yeah. <laughs> this book, most of them are. Like his boss, the 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 crowd with the pitchforks, the bikers he runs into. That's what I find funny too, is the bikers, they're like, Oh, hey, yeah, you're finally here to rule the world. <laughs> like, we've been hailing you for a while, Satan. You know, you know, this the, that that kind of 1980s Satan worshiping biker gang kind of thing pops up right away in the book. Um, you you mentioned that earlier, you know, you grew up like I did in the 80s. We had the whole like kind of satanic uh crazy you know, cra at least the the media pushing that there's satanists out there and the you know there's these and honestly my town there were some evidence of, pe of kids or even grown adults practicing satanic stuff out in some of these haunted locations i've i saw it myself did you experience any of that when you were a kid did you see any of the satanic worship i'm not going to say that we were into that um <laughs> I, I but i will i will say that you're you in know, heavy metal <laughs> yeah, we, we we did. There was one guy. He was kind of. We were kind of friends with him, but to be honest with you, we were kind of scared of him um, because he. It wouldn't surprise me if he did, you know, sacrifice cats and things like that. Because he was oh a he God. was a bad dude. Um, <laughs> so I I wonder what he's doing today because he just. We were all into the same kind of stuff, but he just took it to a different level. Took it too far. Yeah. It's like, hey, we're in the goth. Yeah, here I am. I'm gonna eat this bat's head. You know, right. like, no, no, too far, too far. 
Yeah, I remember those days. I remember those days. <laughs> well, I mean, I remember a, a guy I had in high school. He went as far as to like look up all the sigils and like he wrote down some like like something. I forgot what he wrote. It was like something to unlock a demon to hmm. like pledge yourself to a demon. He did it and then freaked himself out, like lost his mind almost because then like in front of everybody burnt the the the, the sigil and the paper and said, I'm done with this because he got freaked out. I remember what happened, but wow. I have witnesses to this family member that was witness to this to that same exact piece of paper they saw end up right back under his pillow. Is that right? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So he, 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 and I met that guy swears to God, he, he, he buried it. He did everything. He still has that piece of paper. He's like, it will not leave me. And he's like, claims he has a demon following him. I'm like, well, you asked for it. Has his that life was, changed? I don't know. I don't know what happened to him, but he, oh. he, he wasn't good. Hmm. He didn't have a good life. I last I heard of him, it wasn't good. It was oh. not good at all. I mean, he might be in jail for all I know, but you know, that was like at the, that was the early nineties and you know, the tail end of the whole satanic panic of the eighties, you know, but you know, kids, you know, nowadays demons are kind of cool, right? I mean, they're all over <laughs> the place. Yeah. I mean, you have, you have, uh, you know, pop stars, like basically openly, you know, in their music videos and stuff. I, I hear this from my guests, you know, like they're pledging Satan. I, I don't know, but it seems like there's definitely, uh, you know, there's a little darkness going on in Hollywood and some of these celebrities I might be selling their soul. I don't know. I, if you see Jennifer's body, yeah, that horrible movie, but it's funny. Uh, it makes you wonder if any of these people, cause their talent isn't there, uh, sold their soul to, you know, <laughs> get fame or something. There may be something to that. <laughs> you, you, it makes you wonder. It makes you wonder. Um, so now, with with this book, what you know, did was there a general like when you went into writing it, a theme you wanted to get across, or an idea besides like just the the character, but like a point you wanted to get across with the whole premise of the book? I think a lot of people, a lot of the feedback that I've gotten is that people see a lot of satire here about the other or or racism or immigration things like that. Um, I, I didn't have that in mind. I'm I'm glad that people saw it or, or came across. I don't I don't see that so far, but okay. Uh, to me, I, I this is gonna, may sound a little bit cheesy, but I, I saw it kind of a book about um, second chances, so to speak. So you have yeah. Basil living this life, and and I don't want to give up too much away in that regard. But uh, he he does something different, um, and who knows if things are going to end up well for him. Um, but he tries to do something different. Now, you you also being a, you know, we're both later than that. Well, I don't know how old you are, but I mean, with the, the demo, the, I'm, I'm going to be 42 soon. Okay. Uh, the movie that scared me most, and I don't know if it did you when it comes to demonic, is The Exorcist. Hmm. And uh, I read a really good book called American Exorcism. Uh, I can't remember the name of the author at the moment, but he wrote, it was a, he's a psychologist, wrote a book about the effects of The Exorcist in the 70s. Uh, on pop culture and and on religion on with people like the craze of people think they were demonically possessed um did you did, did the exorcist influence you in this anyway i know it, that's definitely a different kind of demonic than this but did it influence you anyway that that kind of the demonic fear of the exorcist it did um a lot of those movies um really freaked me out the the exorcist freaked me out um i would say if there's one movie that did it for me it was actually poltergeist um oh yeah it was, that uh, one scene toward the end with, um, I don't even know what, what this thing was, but the the white witch in the hallway that was kind of terrorizing Joe Beth Williams. Um, but yeah, that that really freaked me out. But there, there was a lot of really good 80s movies that uh, kind of pushed me farther down the path. Demon Knight. <laughs> you, you remember that one? Oh, my, that, is that the Tales from the Crypt one? No, not the Tales from the Crypt one. No, this is the one that was before that. It's about like, the, and they remade this. It was awful. Uh, but it was, it, flew, it scared the crap out of me as a kid, even though it was so cheesy. It's the one with the girl with the lipstick. No, I don't think I've seen this. No, no. Yeah. The, the, like, the, okay, so it's like a bunch of teenage kids break into this old um, morgue. And they unleash, unleash this demon inside there, and it pe starts possessing the different teenagers. There's that a horrible scene like... with with a girl and lipstick and a guy <laughs> that I took. You want to know it's really bad. You want to know it's really bad. And this is going to minute. Sorry, grandma. And she's up there in heaven. Uh, me and my three cousins <laughs> were my two cousins. We were all like a month or two apart from each other. We Our grandmother used to take us to movies. And this is like, you know, 80s. And somehow I don't know how we did this. We convinced her that Demon Knight was not a 
bad movie for kids. <laughs> <laughs> we, did, we got our grandmother in the movie theater. And you know what? She didn't force us out of there. She just walked out and left us there to watch wow. this movie. I We got her butt spanked pretty hard for that one. But <laughs> we got to finish watching the whole movie. But man, when I was a kid, I, I was into all that. I watching all that horror stuff. Now as an adult, I can't watch it so much anymore. But when I was a kid, I watched all that 80s, 90s horror movies, anything demonic. I was like, oh yeah, totally going to watch it. Uh, so yeah, it definitely has an influence on us. Now, researching it, I, I had an experience just when I first started doing the show, I did a whole, I was going to do a whole show on the demonic I mean, it was before I was getting guests and stuff. And, uh, and I did, I did do the show and I, I mentioned it on the show. And this would be the very like sixth or seventh episode. I did a paranormal soup. Um, what is, uh, what's the name of the famous case? Uh, Annalise. Um, what is it, Rob, Jamie? Elsa Lamb, Elisa Lamb. Not Elisa Lamb, no, no, no. Demonic, uh, famous oh. demonic possession. Um, Annalise, I think, is the first name of the person. It was, it's a famous demonic case. They made a movie of it, changed the name of the person. But anyways, there's a bunch of audio out there of her exorcisms, you know, of her, like, during the exorcisms. She died from the exorcism. Mm -hmm. I'm sure somebody's going to get it to me here in the chat room. I'm looking for it. Haunting of Annalise or something like that. I was listening to the recordings of that for research because I was going to play some of it on the show. Something scratched me down my back. Wow. Hot, Anna fiery Lise. scratch. Go ahead. Annalise Michael? Yes. Or Michelle Michael? No, it, Annalise. It should be Annalise, I'm pretty sure. It's, yeah, the last name is M-I-C-H-E-L. Yeah. Yeah, that, that a real case, real honey. She died. And if you see the pictures of her, she's like, scary. it's scary as hell. Like, you could... You know, real, real, real case. It went to court. I mean, there's like I said, they did a whole movie on this. But I, listening to those recordings, you know, they say even I, I remember when I was a, a, a teenager, I used to go to this coffee shop and it was owned by this Greek family. And the son and the, the father were Orthodox, like Catholic Orthodox Greek, something like that. And uh, they were they believed in de demonic possession and they knew an exorcist and they were like, oh, uh, the, the son is like, I've heard the recordings of the, some of the exorcisms, but I'm not supposed to. We're not supposed to talk about it. Mm. And, you know, like you even if you listen to it, you can't listen to him because you could get demonically possessed. And, I, you know, I'm like, yeah, whatever. And then years later, here I am listening to these recordings and I get this hot, fiery scratch down to my back, which is like something went, Shh, like that. And I had a mark down my back. Wow. And I'm like, oh, done. Listen to that. So doing research for this, did you have any fear? that something could get to you or you could be opening up a doorway yeah and to your point that you hear all the time that people say even talking about the stuff like we are now right. uh, could be a vulnerability um but yeah I, I reading a lot of the like the, the grimoires or like the the the, the books of, of describing these demons it reminds me of being a kid and and reading like the dungeons and dragons book of monsters but then you realize that these things are supposed to be real exorcism so, of emily rose Anna, oh, okay, that's that's the movie, but her name was Annalise Michaels or something like that. Annalise, the Exorcist tapes. Don't recommend go listening to them. All right, go ahead. Gotcha. Just want to get that out there. <laughs> no, but I feel the same way. I mean, there are certainly. It, it reminds me of like the first time I heard you mention the Misfits earlier. The Misfits Earth AD. I was probably fourteen when I heard that. I remember the first time I heard it. I actually felt physically ill because I'd never <laughs> heard something like it before. Yeah. So I feel the same way when I start reading about this stuff too intently, I just have to walk away from it and, and just do something light um, because it is, it's heavy stuff. I felt that way when I would research people like Lister Crawley, hmm. like his life, I was just interesting. Cause I mean, if you look at some of these people that they full on believed in demon demons, but they were like, you know, all into trying to control them with magic and, and then, then their lives ended up pretty bad. And, yeah. uh, you know, I mean, Alistair Crowley is a perfect example of that. But, I mean, he was, I mean, part of World War II, uh, communicating with the Nazis because the Nazis were into occultism, that the the, the, um, the uh, OS used him, and so did the British, you know, M, you know, MI5 or whatever. They used him. Uh, and this guy believed in demons and, and bringing demons inside of him and using magic and stuff like that. I mean, heck, they're still trying to, they're still burning down his house as they keep mm. trying to rebuild it. I mean, this guy left an imprint. You know, but if you look at his life, he, it was really bad. You know, yeah. so I mean, I I think if you, you dabble in it, it could could be a bad thing. It could, yeah. it could end up with bad stuff. I mean, so I mean, what kind of things did you like? You said you researched sigils and you looked at the grimoire. Like, did you find anything interesting in there that you kind of like wanted to include in the book, or did you kind of like I don't want to give like get put actual demonic stuff in the book? I so. 
nothing nothing i i borrowed per se like i, I talked about uh, a few of the things that uh, that are, are part of that lore this the sigils and the signs and the names and things like that um just looking at some of the some of the the demons and and what they're supposedly responsible for like apparently if there are these these if you read them um they're very intelligent and people like crowley or whoever else whoever else uh they would bring these things into the world to teach them things um king solomon who's who's You're kind right. of one of the central figures in demonology uh, he apparently used demons to build the temple of jerusalem exactly um, so I find that kind of stuff to be fascinating. And the fact that each one of these demons, the like the 72 and the lesser key of Solomon, they, um, the, each one has their own job, uh, their own thing that they're good at, whether it's architecture or mathematics or philosophy, whatever it might be. Uh, I think that kind of stuff is, again, it's fascinating, but if, if it's true, if it's real, it's, it's kind of terrifying too. Well, I mean, going before Christianity, I mean, people – you know, demons could be good or bad. It was just like gods and, you know, and poly, you know, or in a polytheistic religion, you know, demons could be good or bad. They could come and give you powers. They could help you do things. They could also ruin your life. You know, you could send them to ruin somebody else's life, you mm -hmm. know? So, I mean, demons have been around before they were being cursed by Christianity a, a long time. Like I say, even going back to Samaria, I find it most interesting. Uh, Heather Lynn, that was the guest archeologist uh, we had on when she told us that there's actual like toilet demon, like people were afraid of a, a demon in, in, in the toilets. I mean, that, that that's how far back these things go. Yeah, it's uh, it, you mentioned, like I said, could be good or bad. You uh, there's one that I think of, I think his name, the heck is it, Salos or, or Salios. He's actually like a Cupid figure, um, in that, in that he helps people fall in love and he's actually regarded yeah. as a pacifist, but he does ride a crocodile, which I think is it, which I think is an interesting, um, uh, element of, of what he is supposed to be, what he looks like, and, and what he does with his time. Well, usually, I mean, like, demon descriptions, what demons can look like, could be all over the place. But you have, like, you went with this classic kind of image of a the horn, black body demon. W what chose you to make him that kind of form? Um, that's just kind of what I saw. I know it's. Uh, I mean, he's like I said, he's like he's much like like a satyr. Yeah. Um. So that was just uh, what what I saw him as. There are other creatures below in our fiery home that um, are less than pleasant, like like, like the imps, um, which are kind of these small uh, rotund type creatures and then uh, giant vampire bats. There's uh, a giant cephalopod that lives in the, in the lake of blood. Um, it just, those were what, what popped in. And this is the funny image of a, of uh, this kind of demon working in an office environment. Does he eventually get clothes? I don't want to spoil it for myself, but like I find it funny is like somebody's like in the office, like how dare you let him walk around? I want to see his demon junk or something right. like that. Right. You know, this is it's all right. He's just a demon. They don't wear clothes. True. Yeah. There's a. I, I, you probably haven't gotten to the date. The date yet. There might be some clothes involved there. <laughs> I was just wondering. It's like he's got to stop walking around naked at some point. Somebody's gonna be sick of looking at his junk. Because, I mean, you, you describe him riding the motorcycle and his testicles bouncing off. And I'm like, wow. Okay, yeah, he's naked. He's completely oh, I naked. Ask, I was just yeah. going to ask, do demons actually have junk? But you just answered that. Yes, they do. They do. And they have sex and all kinds of stuff. They're physical in this book. I find that an interesting take. We're going to go to our uh, uh, commercial break here and then open up the phone lines. Call into the show. You got a question? Have you had a demonic experience? You know, or do you believe in demons? Call into the show. We'll talk, join the discussion, but we'll be right back after a short commercial break.
he is conducting an experiment into the combined effects of sensory deprivation and hallucinatory drugs. The subject of the experiment is himself, and the experiment is out of control. Ken Russell's Altered States, a film that must not be missed, is in the West End now. Altered States, Certificate X. Do you wish for more paranormal and spiritual content? The Paranormal Chronicles magazine is a free digital magazine crammed with the very best in paranormal and spiritual articles and features. No sign-up, no subscription, just free reading and knowledge for you. Read today at www.theparanormalchronicles.com forward slash magazine. Oh, come on. I'm Southern, but... Um, nope. That'll do. Hello, I am Kat Hobson, host of Paranormal Experience here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I enjoy having guests from all areas of the paranormal, from ghosts to ufology to cryptids and beyond. You'll find some of the best researchers in their fields bringing you some great information. Join me on Wednesday nights from 8 to 10 p. Eastern here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Night is alive. Join us and take a walk on the weird side when you tune in to the Kingdom of Nye, hosted by Heather Wade, the finest in late night talk. Listen live free weeknights starting at 9 p.m. Pacific time at thekingdomofnye.com, talkstreamlive.com, and the Paranormal Radio app. Want to take a ride? Join us. Every Wednesday night at midnight Eastern Standard Time for Weird Wednesday at the live stream with your host Jamie, the Living Dead Girl, and Rob, the Phantom, where we'll talk about all things paranormal, including zodiac, astrology, tarot card and oracle card readings, live ghost boxing and spirit communication where we'll do Voices from Beyond the Gold Case Files. So we hope you join us live on Facebook and YouTube every Wednesday night at midnight Eastern Standard Time. We hope to see you there. Bye-bye. Paranation Magazine is a new paranormal magazine based out of Denver, Colorado. Our goal isn't just to give you the best paranormal content out there, but to promote paranormal unity. We're doing this by giving everyone an opportunity to tell their stories and to share their experiences. For more information, follow us on Facebook at Paranation Magazine and soon ParanationMag.com. I've Never Met a Dead Person I Didn't Like is the extraordinary travels of a young, alone, and broke psychic in the highly anticipated new book from internationally renowned psychic, medium, medical intuitive, and best-selling author Sherry Dillard. Critics have described I've Never Met a Dead Person I Didn't Like as an engrossing memoir, an empowering story of how a broken girl came to accept her psychic gift, a refreshing and fun read. I've Never Met a Dead Person I Didn't Like is available through Amazon, Kindle, Barnes & Noble, and wherever books are sold. Tired of school? Who is Joan of Arc? Noah's wife? Like to travel? Let's go back into history. Let's reach out and touch someone. Want to meet people in the past? Put them in the Iron Maiden. Iron Maiden? Excellent! Execute them. Odious. Then hitch a ride with George Carlin, Keanu Reeves, and Alex Winter in Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure from Orion Pictures. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You'll love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, 
and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in paranormal talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. Vince, you said before you were waiting for a sign. What sign are you waiting for? Gozer the Traveler. He will come in one of the pre-chosen forms. During the rectification of the Valdrani, the Traveler came as a large and moving tour. Then, during the third reconciliation of the last of the McKetrick supplicants, they chose a new form for him, that of a giant slore. Many shubs and zools knew what it was to be roasted in the depths of the slore that day, I can tell you. Egon. You're listening to Paranormal Soup, bringing you the weird every Sunday night. Call into the show and join the discussion. The call-in lines are 219-230-4444 or 260-225-9419 or by Skype caller ID 00JBland00 or JBland Paranormal Soup. And now to your host, Jason Bland. Tonight's guest is Bill Donahue. He's the author. We're talking about his book, Burn Beautiful Soul. We're talking about demons tonight. Yes, uh, demons of pop culture, how demons influenced him to write this book. Have you experienced the demonic? You know, I, honestly, his book has a hum- humor to it. It's a, like a dark comedy. But when it comes to demonic, it is very serious. It does affect people. I've, it can cost lives. I, I honestly do believe there's some kind of dark force that does affect people's lives and ruin their lives. I, I've seen evidence of that in my own life. I've seen plenty of evidence that in the paranormal community. Uh, So there's something real and dangerous about demons too. But that's what's kind of nice about reading this book is, you know, you kind of get to read about a demon in a more humanistic way, I guess, you know, not, not, not to say demons are good. (laughs) Not trying to say that, but it's entertaining in that sense. Uh, Call in the show. The phone lines are open. 219-230-4444. Skype ID 00JBland00. And there's two other lines you can call in, but let's go ahead and get back to our guests. Thanks for sticking in there with me, Bill. Now, one of the other movies I thought of when I'm reading your book, too, is uh, have you ever seen uh, This Is The End? Love This Is The End. Uh, see, that movie is, like, funny, but scares the hell out of me, too. Mm-hmm. Like, it has, like, it's such a weird movie in the sense that it, like, like it's it's hilarious. It's hilarious. <laughs> It's, it, you know, it, it's hilarious, but it's scary too, especially when the, like the, the, you never actually see the physical demons in the movie. That's what I think is always beautiful when, it, uh, when they don't, less is more, you know, they don't, they don't show you it. They just, they, but they definitely scare you with it. Uh, so did that, did they have any influence in writing this book too? Uh, this is the end. Not so much. I, it's, uh, I, I do think, uh, I do think it's it's interesting to see that uh, you just mentioned about the comedy factor. You have movies like that and TV shows for that matter too, or even books that uh, that do have a lot of comedy to them, um, whether it's us just kind of making light of the things that we're scared of or whatever. Um, but I, that does seem, seem to be an interesting trend. I think of something like uh, like the Evil Dead films and things like yeah, that. Oh, yeah, oh yeah, like two. Bruce Campbell. Oh yeah, yep. uh, Evil. See, Evil Dead's yeah, that's another perfect example where it's like you're scared because of the demonic factor and the creatures and everything going on, but then it has the comedic side to lighten it up just enough so you can handle it. Like Exorcist, I couldn't handle. You know, it's it's straight on demonic, scare the crap out of you. Especially the worst part about when it comes to demons to me is the possession part, hmm. having something take take over you. Uh, but uh, this is the end of. <laughs> was the actor in that um jonah hill when he gets possessed that's it's hilarious but scary as hell at the same yeah. time it's so hilarious but scares the crap out of you at the same time i love that mixture and you definitely have that kind of mixture in this book yeah it's uh i think of that like um so there's there's evil dead there's uh hell baby which was a movie with rob cordry and um keegan michael key from a, a few years back i think somebody told me to watch that what is that one so essentially it's this couple, they move into a house. Um, Leslie Bibb is the wife and she's pregnant and uh, there's something to the house. I think it's in New Orleans. And um, she essentially winds up getting possessed and uh, it's terrifying and there's certainly some scary moments, but uh, it's, I mean, Rob Cordry's the lead. So you can kind of guess how that's gonna go. Um, even, I think there's something like Dogma too, the, the Kevin Smith film. 
Oh, they you had a poop demon in that one, the too. The poop demon, exactly. <laughs> it is. Yeah. Yep. I forgot about dogma. Oh, my yeah. God, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's what I was saying. It's like there, there's a way we can look at the dark side and have a little bit of a laugh at it, I guess, so we can kind of kind of explore it some without being totally terrified. You know, yeah, I, I think you, you bring up a great point just about the, the respect involved because you do uh, – I think we actually know a couple of people in common who have had experiences, um, and they're – one of them in particular um, really sticks with me, a hat man type of situation. And uh, these are things that have just destroyed people's lives. So yeah. I, and hopefully um, my book and, and this other stuff, hopefully it's not disrespectful in any way. I, I really didn't. Uh, I, I, You're going to burn in hell, Bill. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, no, but yeah. uh, so I think there's, a, there's definitely a fine line there. There is, but it's like a, why, you know, we do the show. We do a live spirit box night. Like we have the spirit box running, people call in, and uh, I could go totally, I could have direction wise with that gone totally dark and like make it really spooky because it scares the crap out of people. Just when I've I've had people never experience spirit box and they hear it, they're like, oh, that kind of creeps me out. I could totally dark with it and scare the crap out of people and have, but we keep it fun because <laughs> I don't want the demons, I don't want the darkness. I want to see if we talk to the spirit world, but I don't want it to go demon. You know, right. I don't want to hear any of that. We've gotten that, but I don't want to hear that. You know, I don't want, I, I want to experience the paranormal on the other side, but I, you know, as a paranormal vesker, I've said this plenty of times uh, that if I run into something I feel is truly demonic on an investigation, which I, I have not, but doesn't mean I won't. Um, but if I feel something's truly demonic, I'm going to find somebody else. I mean, I've had a couple cases I feel could possibly be that, but I didn't actually investigate them. You know why? Because the evidence was showing is way out of my league, and I handed it off to somebody else. I'm interested in the paranormal, but I'm not going to be able to help. I'm, I am not going to be coming in as the exorcist. I right. am not going to be solving that problem for somebody. Hmm. So let me get them somebody who can help. You know, the, the, you know, I see a lot of this in um, uh, paranormal reality shows. You know, for so long now. Uh, people go and ghost hunting. He's like, "Come at me, bro!" You know, like to the demon. You know, like oh, there's a everything's a demon. You know, it, you know, the, they'll have the obvious going and be like demon. I'm like, you, if this is really demonic, you're not gonna be airing this on TV. You need to be getting these people help. Right. You know, so it, it, yeah, like you said, there's gotta be a respect to to the phenomenon at least. You know, so you you know somebody that's had a hat man experience. I'm really interested in that because I had a a really bad. When I was 17 to 18. Uh, experience with a shadow person and at one point when it really showed itself to me physically when I was wide awake this thing walked up to me in the middle of the night outside of my parents house I was standing outside smoking a circuit sorry mom dad uh, <laughs> and this thing walked up to me and it was the total hat man like it had this tall head like it had like a hat on like a top hat walk up to me outside most of the time I'd see it just be a black mass or slight figure, but this thing came up to me clear as day when I, you know, towards the end of this thing torturing me. Um, and I, I, that's before I heard of Hat Man or Shadow People. I had this experience, and that's how I got into Art Bell. I don't know if you're familiar who Art Bell was as a radio host, but hmm. Shadow People used to come up on the air. People call in and describe a Hat Man or the Shadow Person. So this is like a phenomenon I got to experience early on before it became a phenomenon. And so you know somebody that had a Hat Man experience? Yeah. Uh, she's... Um you probably know her. I, I'm not. She's. Um, she runs her own podcast, um, and you you may know her. Actually, I thought her. I thought I saw her name pop up earlier. Laura Lee. Yeah. I, about, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Should have known. Laura Lee. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. She's got it, offering her the you know all kind you know talking to her, telling her it's going to offer her, like power and everything. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It, it's it's very really similar to my experience because this thing would come to me in my dreams. At first, that's how it first started. It was really bad nightmares of this thing coming and ripped me out of my, my soul out of my body and take me and showing me things that were still too personal for me to talk about. Uh, but it would show me things that I wouldn't have any, shouldn't have any knowledge of, like my girlfriend cheating on me. Like showed me the exact scene and she confirmed it to me wow. later. You know, so I, I, like I said, I take this subject very seriously. Like it's nice. I like your book. I love your book. I like to be able to laugh about these things. I love these movies and the pop culture and stuff like that. I, I you know, I'm a Gnostic, so I'm not like you're gonna burn in hell. Uh, but I, I am a definite believer in these things affecting people and hurting people or doing really bad things. So I don't recommend people go searching for demons yeah. or or dabbling in demonic anything at all. You're gonna have a bad time, as they say in South Park. <laughs> Yeah, I have uh, another friend of mine. He's actually a, I, I've known him for probably 25, 30 years. And he had uh, kind of a, a sleep paralysis issues, uh, like the old hag. Yes, yes. And um, so to hear him describe it, and that's the thing, because does, 
Yeah, I, I, I want to believe people for what for what they say, and I believe that 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 uh, they truly believe that it happened to them. Um, for him, I, I know he's had a lot of trauma in his life, and I'm not sure if that played a role in anything, if that in some ways brought it to him. But um, it just seems that one bad thing happens, like, like bad things kind of just follow follow themselves. It's kind of weird. It, this, this is the thing I find with the demonic, though. The people in my life that have said they've been tormented by it. I've met people that believe they are being tormented by demo demons, and I'm not laughing at them because I know that I'm not, never going to do that to somebody. Mm -hmm. Because my experience, I, didn't, I couldn't tell anybody. You know, like they'll lock me up, put me in a straitjacket. You know, the live through that. I have a deep empathy for anybody, even if it's not real, even if whatever it doesn't matter. They believe it is. Right. It's affecting their lives. It, it's it's horrible. I honestly do believe there are demonic things affecting people. Um, I even have had been with brown people. I don't know if it's a, you know some people say it's a discernment whatever that I got away from that I believe could be infested with something demonic because of how bad the negative energy was coming off of them. Mm. Like that that's just not their personality or anything. There's something else there. You know I, I've had a couple weird experiences like that. Have you run into anybody else you felt like was maybe they got some demons uh, there's one person i think of in my life now uh, i won't be too Don't specific yeah, but, but. <laughs> it just it seems like one bad thing is happening it's it just i don't know how one person can deal with so much tragedy and um i i fear for this person um this person has never said any now i'm just i'm being genderless here um yeah. but uh I don't know how one person can deal with, with this kind of stuff. Uh, there's been no mention of uh, demonic forces or anything like that, but um, it's just like surrounded by darkness. Yeah, yeah. I, I met people like that. Also, I see, I see addiction plays a lot into mm -hmm. uh, what people call generational uh, demonic, you know, infestation with families. You know, I've had uh, Bill Bean on here, spiritual warrior. Uh, several times talk about that on this show um, about demons falling people through their families. I, I, I knew somebody um, who swore her whole family of women were haunted by a hag. Wow. And she thought it was a demon. You know, it wasn't human or whatever, but she saw it. Her mother saw it. Her sister saw it. Her grandmother saw it. Her grandmother's grandmother saw it. At some point all in their life, all the women of this family would see this horrible hag-like woman attack them you know, in the middle of the night, they all had those experiences. So, I mean, again, you know, it's good to make light and I, I recommend this book to have a good time, <laughs> but doesn't mean let's go have fun with demons. Let's not do that <laughs> because there is a danger. There's a big danger. I tell this to all my, anybody that's interested in the paranormal or being an investigator, it's all good and fun. You get recordings, EVPs, photos, but if you run across something that is like, you feel is truly demonic, you get somebody else to take care of it. Get, yeah. get the person help. Don't turn your back. I hate it when paranormal investigators just turn their backs on people. Um, maybe sometimes there's reasons because they can't help them. It's just too much mental health issues going on. It's not yeah. paranormal. But um, but when they turn their backs on people, I hate that. But try to get them help from somebody that does know how to do it. That, that, and it's hard. It's hard to find people help. For, you know, People aren't just going to try to take their money. There's a lot of that going on, too. You know, uh, But there are good people out there trying to help people. Uh, we do have a phone call. Let's go ahead and get to this. We've got Zach on the line. How you doing tonight, Zach? I'm doing pretty good, brother. How are you doing? Doing good. Thanks for calling in. So I have two questions. I'll keep them as short as possible. Hey, William, love every, you're hearing every, love hearing everything that you're saying. My first question to you is: Demons they can use uh, really somebody's weakness, or they can use addiction, or something personal in their lives. But my question to you is: Based on some of the research that you've done, have you ever heard of any demonic encounters to where demons use uh, pop culture, common fears to instill fear in someone to gain power from them? That's interesting. I actually, I heard that I was talking to someone not long ago talking about TikTok and oh, whether geez. demons have, have influenced TikTok, things That's like a that. Good, right. It's, um, I, I mean, I, Again, demons are supposed to be very intelligent and, and have just a lot of capabilities that uh, we might not even know of. So, I mean, if I were them, I, I would use whatever is available. If I'm if, if my goal is to torture someone or to you know separate them from their soul or separate them from God or whatever, I mean, I guess I would use whatever means I have available. And the internet. 
Exactly. <laughs> exactly. All right. And then the second question that I have really goes back to um, it's, it's really something that's perplexed me is that, you know, it's stated in the Bible that God gave man free will. And originally, demons were angels that fell from heaven because, of course, Satan didn't want to be seen as below human beings. So my question is, whenever somebody wants a demon to go away, like I've had my own demonic encounters before. I've told it to go away. You are not welcome here. But still, they feel like they don't have they don't have to answer to that kind of authority they don't have to answer to somebody who has free will can you explain why a demon would have that kind of mentality to where somebody does have to call upon god or jesus for help in removing a demonic entity so essentially uh, just to make sure i understand your question so essentially why would a demon put him put itself in a position where it has where there's going to be a conflict yeah exactly Okay. Uh, so I don't know the answer to that. I mean, there may be. So if, if you think about the, the 72 demons, each demon has its sub demons that it controls. Uh, it, it, and again, this may be a complete stretch, but uh, it may be that that demon is being ordered by its kind of commander, so to speak, to infest a certain person or, or whatever it might be. Uh, in, in which case it would really have no control. Uh, that, that's just a guess. I have no idea. Um, but I guess it really depends on what, what demons are, are here for. If we believe that they're here and we believe they're here to cause harm, uh, that's going to be their, their, primary, their primary purpose. They say that, that demons are, are immortal. Even demons cannot die. So uh, I, I guess the stakes are fairly low. Yeah, they just go back to hell. All right. <laughs> you know, that's all the risk. Oh, I got to get kicked back to hell. All right, cool. Well, those are all the questions I have. Thank you so much, William, for answering that question. And really quick before I go, I when I was hearing about the uh, demon working in an office dream, I couldn't help but think back over to Catbert from the Dilbert cartoons and just thinking about that. Just when you think about a demon working in an office, well, you got a cat who's literally demonic and running the human resources department. Like, oh, yes. Oh, yeah, <laughs> like yeah, yeah. in their own little personal hell. Nice. <laughs> Offices are. You know what? That, that's yeah, I'm a Supernatural fan. Uh, the, t the TV show Supernatural. I mean, my son's named Dean, but uh, the the Crowley demon in that. What I love when there's a scene where all these people are standing in line in hell. <laughs> you find out Crowley's like, yeah, we got over the whole torturing people, like physical torture. We found more subtle things that torture people way worse, like making them wait in an eternal line. <laughs> like, oh, that, that, that to me is more realistic. What probably hell is like for me. I know I will be in hell if I wake up in a room that I can't get out of, and I'm forced to listen to Kanye West or, or uh, Shakira or Taylor Swift, that music's just playing over and over again, I know I'm in hell. That'd be, you can physically torture me, pain, all that stuff, I'll get old. If you can do that, it'll, it'll like, drive me insane. All right, thanks, Zach, for calling in. All right, yeah, everybody, think, have a good night. Thank you. Yeah, I think Dante needs to, um, to update the, uh, the, the circles of hell to include the things like, you just said. Yeah, well, this is the thing. Like, you can, you know, a lot of people picture the fiery lakes are going to be ripped apart, tortured. As a kid, I just drove me nuts, that idea. I'm like, well, if you're already dead, what does physical pain, torture? I mean, they can only kill you once, right? I mean, they kill you again, what happens? You know, like those, those ideas, they show people pitchforks and burning and hell and all this stuff. I'm like, yeah, but you're dead. So what would it matter what they do to you like that? I mean, yeah, you can feel pain for so long, but then it just becomes a you know you put that input that pain input eventually wears out you know there's gotta be a hell's probably way worse like uh bill and ted's uh um the second movie when they go to hell like the guy being kissed by <laughs> was it uh ted getting kissed no no bill his grandmother with the whiskers and like come here let me give you a kiss like all these frightening scenes that they're replaying from their life things that like really terrified you as a child or things that really tortured you in life i could see being used against you that would be hell right you know Waiting in the eternal line, <laughs> you know, you know, for something would be awful, you know, or or uh, or having to sit through a, uh, a, a, a human resources video lecture, you know, like for eternity. Those things, yeah. I think that's more like what hell might be like. I don't know. 
Well, it's interesting. Like you mentioned some of Dante's, uh, like the, the, the first, what is it? The nine circles, right? So probably the first yeah, one or two circles. circles weren't really all that bad. I mean, right. probably at the time it, that was, um, at the time they were probably like, oh, wow, this is really awful. But right. uh, we could probably upgrade on those now based on just where we are in today's world. And all new ways to torture humanity. I, mm -hmm. I, I, does, I do. I, I always say it like my favorite fictions are stuff to do with the supernatural and the afterlife. Like, you know, my favorite movies are all have to do with like the afterlife, usually more on the good side, like um, uh, defending your life. You know, I don't know if you've ever seen that movie yeah. or uh, what you definitely recommend go see Defending Your Life. Um, oh, I can't think of the name of the actor, uh, the main actor in that, too. Go see Defending Your Life. That's all. That's more of like do good. You're good. You might be, you know, basically you have a lawyer that has to defend you and your actions in life <laughs> to move on. There's like no hell in that one. Hmm. But I do like the ones with hell in the afterlife, you know, uh, or, or purgatory like Beetlejuice, you know, happens to like suicides end up having to work in an office. You know, like for the rest of their eternity, you know, th those things always fascinate me. Like, you know, could we make our own hell? Also, when it comes down to demons, demons might be a creation of our own subconscious, too. I mean, we've had uh, Dr. Barry Taff on here is very much into like the environment and human psychokinetics and people basically creating their own paranormal activity. You know, they could demons could be a, a, a you know a topa in a, in their own sense, created from their own human imaginations. I'm I'm willing to believe any of those things are possible, but I do believe there's something there affecting people. Uh, I I can absolutely see that. I mean, I think uh, I'm not sure about you guys, but uh, I can think of uh, a time in my life 15 years ago where I really did feel like I was in hell just because because of the circumstances that I created and the things that I believed, um, and I don't recognize who that person was now. Like, I can't imagine yeah, exactly. being in that headspace. So I, I can totally see something like that coming to bear. Oh, well, when I went through my shadow person experiences, exactly the description of it is I am a different person than I was then. I was in my own personal hell that this thing knew how to twist and turn me into. Hmm. Uh, I, it couldn't do that to me now, you know, but I've, I've grown and accepted the things that it tried to use against me. Uh, for that, I feel lucky. Uh, you know, it's a rare experience. I don't want people to go through the experience I did. Uh, but I do feel, in a way, a weird way, kind of lucky that I, I did experience it because it made me read a lot, of, a lot of personal things about myself. Mm -hmm. And that's why I always struggle with, like, is it my own personal topa? You know, a shadow person. It's, in essence, an archetype is your shadow, your, your dark self. I, 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 I've, re I've wrestled with that idea, even though this scene totally felt truly alien to me. And it, it physically touched me at one point. The way the scene ended, I even told you, and I know the audience knows this, but it ended for me with the scene levitating me up off my bed and throw me down three times. And the third time it levitated me up, I was like, dear God, help me. Like in my, I couldn't speak, I couldn't move, but in my mind, I'm like, God, please, please, I'm so sorry, help me. And flash light, this thing, I saw this dark shadow of like thing screech. And then a person walked through the light and it looked like somebody later on I could see was probably my great grandfather. But I feel completely lucky to have been saved that day. It didn't turn me into like a Christian, but it turned me into a believer that there's something at the end of the tunnel, right. that there is something watching out for us, just in the general theory. Um, so, I, like I said, I, this is why I take people's stories and experiences in the demonic very seriously, because what happened to me, I'm not ex willing to accept it was demonic, but it was definitely dark, terrifying, and there's definitely something unexplained affecting us. Yeah. I've almost thought, I mean, we've had a guest on here who, um, oh, what was it called? Oh. Uh, I can't remember the name of the guest in his book, but it basically he took a scientific kind of approach to what these were and looked at it as like a parasite uh, on the uh, on a plane that we can't see in another dimension. That and this is the the part that really creeped me out about it is that they, these para, these the things we call demons are more like a parasitic entity that's laying eggs in our energy field. <laughs> That, wow. that the whole idea creeps me out, uh, and and that's what we're all the effects of the 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 weird stuff that happens is this 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 parasite feeding off of your energy and, and reproducing. It was really crazy concept, a really interesting concept, but also fright more frightening even more. Yeah, wow, I that I never that really that that creates a vision when you say that like a demon laying eggs in our energy field. Um, I always think of. The, uh, what people always want to know is whenever anything bad happens is, is why, like whether it's uh, whether it's uh, a murder or, or, a, or 
any kind of bad thing, including being pestered by some kind of dark or malevolent force. Yeah. Why did this happen? Uh, I'm not sure if you've ever gotten to the, the, the heart of that or have any ideas about it, but uh, that's uh, it's well, that's because I'm it's truly fascinated with because of my own yeah. experience, because what happened to me, this thing wanted to be either hurt myself or hurt others. Hmm. And that's why it was hard to talk about, you know, like people are going to think you're crazy or you're, you're, you're a danger, you know. Um, and so it makes me wonder when people do snap, when people, no explanation, go crazy and do something completely horrible. If there is, I mean, I have to ask the question. I have to wonder, is there a demonic influence or is just humans being bad humans? Yeah. You know, I, I hate to, you know, not per personal responsibility on somebody. In a way, it's always their personal responsibility. I mean, in my own situation, it was trying to, I had to make the choice. Yeah. You know, saying it was trying to push me to make that a, a horrible choice either way. But, but is there something that's affecting people? There's a, um, uh, Ed and Lorraine Warren, there was a case they had, and there's videotape of it out there. You can find it on YouTube and it's been on documentaries and that, of a, uh, and I, I can't remember the name of the man. I think he was, um, Hispanic and, uh, his wife had called them to help because he, he had, exp you know, exhibited signs of, 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 you know, basically demonic possession and he hold on we got a oops sorry one second i had a phone call and it disappeared i tried to pick it up no dang it try call whoever just tried calling try calling back i think i hit the wrong button so try calling back if you called in i am so sorry i don't know why it hung up on him anyways this case um and i'm sure people watching the show have probably have seen this and i actually played this on my show when my first when i did the demonic episode because this one affects me real bad when i've seen it and you can say what you want about Ellen and Ray and Warren, but they tried to help these people. And there's a, there's a videotape of when they actually brought a priest in to do an exorcism on this guy. And you see like his head crack open and like blood start to come down. And then his eyes turn to like almost reptilian like slits. The creepiest part about that, let me see, I'm gonna try to take, I got the phone, hold one sec, to take the phone call. Please say it's taking that call. I've had problems with my phone lines lately, sorry. Technical problems here think we got somebody if you're on the line hold in there i'm gonna get to you in just a second but in this shot in this video you see his head crack open his eyes turn to like slits and it's one of the most creepiest videos out there i've seen you know i remember what is it dateline or 2020 or somebody did like the whole demonic they they aired a uh, an exorcism and all that none of this compares to that videotape because what you see there looks completely evil you get the feeling of evil and the end story the real end story what happened that's horrible he ended up Later on, after that, blowing his wife's off, arm off with a shotgun and trying to kill her and then blew his own head off. Wow. This is why this stuff is it's serious. I mean, Edelman Rain Warren, you, they have their critics, and I've criticized them on some things, but they were the original people going out there helping people nobody else was and sadly could not help this couple. They knew it was serious. You know, these, these cases can end in real bad situations. Yeah, in some ways, it's almost uh, uh, reassuring to think that there might be something else at play, like that we couldn't possibly behave as bad as we are, that we're not doing these things by ourselves. There's something else that making us do things. It's almost comforting in a way to think that something else is responsible. But well, again, you, you talked about personal responsibility, but uh, it, it's it's something to consider. Well, you see some of these deliverance ministries or whatever you want to call them. Uh, I mean, I, in this book, American Exorcism kind of talks about this too, but where like there's a demon for every ailment and addiction, like, you know, like you see the, like going around and people start like, it's like a mass hypnosis. Some people say it is, or it's really demons, but they, you know, have all these people start freaking out. To, I'm trying to think of the guy that is real famous for doing this, but I mean, like literally people saying they got demons in their JJ. I mean, like mm. that kind of stuff, like crazy yeah. stuff, like the demons in my, you know, I'm not going to say it, but that kind of stuff going on. Yeah. And, and it makes you wonder, are there other forces like that? Especially if you think about the parasitic thing I brought up, we got another mm. phone call. I want to get to them before we lose them. 860 area code. Who do we got? Hey everybody. It's Adrian from Connecticut. Hey Adrian. Hey, Adrian. Hi. I wanted to share something. Yeah. That was a personal experience. And it leads me to believe why demons possess people. Because when I was younger, I met something that was separated from God. It was of the lowest vibrational frequency, and being near it 
was extremely painful from the soul out. I would have to describe it as being a combination of fire and ice. And I'm mm. wondering if this is where they get cold as hell or hot as hell. Mm. But it was so extremely painful that I was near death. I was just a, a hair away from death. And now I've also experienced uh, years back two days in a row where I was visited by white light where there was love so extreme that I was almost ready to collapse. Something visited me that was just full of love. So it was like completely opposite of this black oh, thing. Wow. So my, yeah, my theory is that if demons possess somebody, they are not only doing the, let's just say Satan's bidding, but they are able to escape that feeling of being separated from God, which is horrible. That's where I think all the torture comes from, is you're just around a really low vibrational frequency, and, and love is a very high one. Well, they're definitely two different so, feelings. I've kind of had some makes... experience. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's about all I wanted to chip in, but um, possession, I guess, happens for many, many reasons, whether it's invited or not. But I think it's their escape. And yeah. by being able to escape, they are able to do the bidding of their master hmm. and take us down. So, well, th that's about it, folks. <laughs> that's about it. Just share that little nibbit for people. But yeah, that, you know, when you when you talk about Adrian, uh, about that feeling of that overwhelming love, that's what I experienced. Okay, so I had the whole dark feeling when I'm being that when I was experiencing a shadow person when it was levitating me off my bed. Yeah. I'm praying to God that's whole evilness, but the, what it was what, that that flashlight wasn't just a flashlight; it was a feeling. Like I felt the warmth and love come through that, and that's what this scene hated and went away from it. Really, with a flashlight now? Not a flashlight. It's You're a flash saying? of light. It was a flash of light, and and this oh, thing. Oh, flash of light. Okay. Flash of light, and in that flash of light, I felt like the the room completely changed from this horror, wretched feeling that this scene's imposing on me, to immense like I'm here for you, love. That's the only thing. I, like, right. I'm not alone. Hmm. Was the feeling? Yeah, it was. It was pretty cut and dry. I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah, I, I get it. I totally get it. Well, thank you so much yeah. for calling in. Thanks for having me. Bye. Now, you know, we're talking about personal experiences and, we, you know, we've talked about pop culture and where everything meets in the middle, you know, uh, how we can have humor with demons. But there, like we said, there is a, the real side of this, the, the, the real demons out there. And, and uh, you know, to me, the scariest part of the whole dem demonic, you know, experience is the possession part that you know you get way you don't have that in your book you know the possession part that that's just to me that you get to that that's when things get scary when it starts possessing people like this case uh with the warrens i was talking about we lost rob hopefully he comes back um but ed lorraine warren had this case and it went south for them that you know this is why i tell people you get into the paranormal don't go looking for demons you don't want to, if somebody's being afflicted with it get help somebody who knows how to deal with it because these things can get dangerous. And that's what makes you wonder how many people that are doing evil things or flipping them out demonically possessed. I mean, some, you have serial killers that, you know, were praising Satan, like, um, Richard Ramirez, hmm. the night stalker, you know, you know, he, he was full on Satan's my buddy, you know, he believed in demons, you know, there's, he's not the only one. Yeah. So it makes you wonder how much they, they are influencing people or how, you know, look at the Nazis. I mean, they had the false society. Now, they didn't think they were praising Satan or the devil. They were trying to communicate with extraterrestrial beings or beings on another lev level. But, I mean, it could be all H.P. Lovecraft and go bad. I don't know. But hmm. obviously, things weren't good for the Nazis. Obviously, that was evil. <laughs> Whatever it was trying to, you know, if they, if they got something that communicated with the Nazis, it wasn't good. All right. I'm reading a book right now, actually. It's uh, I've been just going piece by piece. It's uh, Nazis, Nazism in the occult, and it really is. It's yeah. it's, it's fascinating that something like that, some, like forest magic and astrology and pendulums and all that kind of stuff, were part of uh, a, a national government and basically determined where the country went. And it's some of the speeches that uh, that were made from Hitler and others were just mind blowing. Uh, that that this was this was policy. Yeah, it was secret. It wasn't like out in the open, 
But Heimrich Lim Himmler and the SS, I mean, they were all into it. They were literally trying to impregnate women on top of graves to bring the Aryan souls into the women. I mean, this is how far out there they got. Yep. I mean, it, there's a famous castle the the Nazis held for uh, uh, during the war. Uh, where was it? That has the, the supposed gateway to hell in it. I mm -hmm. mean, they, they were interested in that. This is the reason they took the castle. I can't think of the name of it right now. It's too late at night. We got we got another phone call too. Uh, another eight six zero area code. Who do we got? Hi, Jason. This is Ariana. Hey, is Ariana? How, How you are doing? You tonight? Doing good. Good. Oh, excellent. I'm glad you're on. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> I wanted to uh, uh, say something about a personal experience that I. I had years ago, lots of years, years ago. I um, I was trying to help this family, and because um, they were being uh, tortured, the kids were being tortured. They mm. couldn't sleep, things like that. The whole house. It was the apartment. It was the whole house. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I tried so. You know, I, I was not knowledgeable and uh, sort of being silly because, you know, you watch ghost hunters and things like that. Right? My point exactly. So, yes. <laughs> so, so, I, you know, I gave them uh, some kind of advice and things like that. Well, um, unfortunately, it came to, bit, to bite me back because I had first said um, uh, they were saying something about footprints, little kids' footprints and stuff like that. Ooh. And so I, I said, so put talcum powder in the room, and then, you know, and then tomorrow I'll see, you know, if it's true or not, you know. And, um, of course, it was because there was all kinds of these footprints and oh, really? like that. So, yeah, so I was like, oh, okay. And then I – and then – there was a room that was sealed off, and every time I was in there, or not, you know, the, the room outside of the sealed room, I was always smelling smoke and seeing smoke. Ooh. And I was, and when I was there, I was telling them, I said, "You got to get out. There's a fire. There's a fire." You know? Yeah. And they would say, "There's not," you know. And I said, "But I'm, you know, I'm smelling this," you know. And um, come to find out from past tenants, it was in a, a three-family uh, house, come to find out that um, that room that was sealed, it had a stained glass window, but it was moreover, uh, um, it, it wasn't a good, it, it, it was like a signal, a, a, sig a sigil? signal, uh, maybe, the, uh, yeah, yeah, a, yeah. A sigil, yeah. But it was... Yeah, and so it was kind of, it, and and what happened was that there were fires in there, and they, Ooh. and that whoever bought it had sealed off that room because everything that was in the room either burned or they felt or people felt like they were burning and things Ooh. like that. It wasn't a good, thing, you know. But um, um. I finally had to get out of it because I, I couldn't help these poor people, you know, and their family and stuff like that. So I called up um, friends, a friend of Lorraine and Ed Warren at the time. I don't even know if he's still alive. Yeah. And um, I could never get in touch with him because every time I tried to call him on a landline, this is that's how long ago, Yeah. Um, the phone would would crack and go dead and things like that, you know? Yeah. And um, so I finally had to um, uh, leave it to some somebody else. But after that, I kind of realized I was kind of silly and stupid because, you know, just watch it. You know, not every, you have to be trained. You have to have a, a respect, you know, for these things, you oh, know? Yeah. And there is evil out there, you know? But the the only the only advice that I've learned from it is that if you feed it, if if you get the more scared you get, the more fear that you get, it yeah, grows. Ex yeah, exactly. Yes. And after years of 
I could have sworn that I had a black cloud over myself, you know, and my family because of this uh, experience and stuff. But um, after I learned not to feed it, it went away. Yeah. It just, you laugh at, you don't, you know, you don't give it anything, you know? So, like I said, now I have respect and, you know, I've learned quite a lot of things. But, you know, you, you got to really, you, you got to really um, decide, you know, what you're going to do, you know? Yeah, I, I mean, it, you, you got you to... You, you, it's like having an animal or something, you know, a dangerous animal or something. You, you got to, you, you can have it as a pet or whatever, but you better respect it because if you turn your back or do the wrong thing, you might end up dead. Exactly. Exactly. Were you, exactly. Was this, hey, was this yeah. the one, were, this, were you the one that had the, the, the whole painting, uh, was it the Mother Mary Jesus painting with the scratches on the back or something on that? What was that? Was that you? That wasn't you, was it? Uh, right. So many people send me stuff for the show, yeah. <laughs> you know, stuff that they've experienced. Well, thank you, Zariana, for calling in. Uh, thank you, and you ha everyone have a good night. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 So you hear people have demonic experiences. <laughs> I know yeah. a lot of them that do watch, that watch the show or listen. You know, it, it's something serious, but I, I you know, you know I, I do enjoy books and movies and stuff that do have a way of making a little bit of light or a way to look at it in a funny or humorous way, it, it, I think is entertaining. I, I can't help it. I do love it. Like I said, all the movies in my past I enjoyed, you know, were like that. Um, for you, you know, in the end, are you going to write more books like this? Or are you kind of like dwelling into another territory? What, what are you planning on uh, getting into in the future? I've written two novels since this one. Um, neither one is kind of a horror romance. Another one is more of like post post apocalyptic sci fi. Um, so right now I'm kind of um, determining what comes next, and um, I I might go back into this world. I'm not not this exact world, but um, yeah. I find that my Catholic upbringing. Um, again, I'm not Catholic anymore, but. Um, but it a lot of source material. <laughs> yeah, it, it influences like me greatly, and I really don't want it to. Um, as, as, <laughs> like when I actually f wrote the first draft of this book, it was I, I was amazed at how much of my upbringing was in there, and I'm like, I gotta get. I, it's very frustrating to deal with it. So, um, it like I said, it's good source material, but um, it wouldn't surprise me to go back into this this neck of the woods. Well, it's it's dogma, you know. It's it's the what you know people are raised in. We have, and it, like you said, in, in Christianity, you know, everybody associates it with a lot of the, when you talk about the devil and demons. But like I said, this goes back to every religion culture. They're just like dragons and unicorns. You can find them in all these different cultures throughout all of history, you know. So that, to me, that tells you there's something there. There's something real. We're they're all trying to describe something we're encountering, right? Uh, you know be it something from hell or another dimension or alien i don't know but there's something affecting people there's something yeah. people are experiencing that the you know that makes this a real phenomenon we, we've let it go by now if that was if it wasn't the case you know yep. but there's something real to what you know people are experiencing when it's the demonic um now that you know you said you enjoyed cryptid stuff too you know and, and then he's kind of like a cryptid in this because he's a physical creature i mean it makes right. me think of like the jersey devil i don't know if you're familiar with the jersey devil at all oh yeah he's uh i mean we're jersey's uh right 40, 40 minutes from here but yeah people who grow up in jersey i mean they really physically that's kind of like a, a rite of passage you absolutely believe in that stuff um for me i i'm not sure do you remember the lizard man uh, i'm sure you've talked about him yeah like uh, um he there's a famous case um where he attacked a young man in his car hmm it jumped on his car, attacked his car, and there was like physical evidence on his car. There's one of those cases. There's a number of different lizard mans in the country. I'm trying to remember where that one is the one I was the most fascinated with, and I can't remember now. I don't know if it's I, the same lizard man you're talking about. I just remember this was uh, probably 1988, and mm -hmm. um, there was a big, there was a, a scare. It was like just uh, incidents after incidents. I think it was South Carolina. And, yeah, um, sounds right. I remember that summer, my parents were driving us to Florida, and I, I was so sure that I was going to see the lizard man if I <laughs> kept my eyes peeled. But 
didn't did not work out. But yeah, I, th- I think that, that kind of stuff is fascinating. See, I I, I totally would want to see Bigfoot. Like I would want to see Bigfoot, maybe even Dogman, you know. Hmm. But I would not want to see Lizardman because I have a theme with reptiles. I can't do reptiles. I I don't want to see like you know the David Icke reptilian shapeshifters. I don't want to see a rep- the lizard man. You know, I would like to see some evidence of it, <laughs> but I don't want to be the one to get the physical evidence of it because they freak me out. Yes, gotcha. Rob, snakes. They suck. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, I would have been that way as a kid too. Like somebody tell me I'm going through an area where there's a lizard man. I've been looking out the window, not wanting to see him, but wanting to see him. Right. Well, we got another call coming in. Hold on. Let me make sure I get this right. My phone lines have been real bad. We got 856 area code. Who do we got on the line? It's me, Jason. Is this D? It's D. Hey, D. How you doing? Yes. Thanks okay. for calling in. Oh, oh, you're very welcome. I get results tomorrow from my from my MRI test tomorrow. Good. Your voice sounds like it's really hurting, so take it easy. It it is, Ooh. but I wanted to. T- I was thinking about my grandfather, my mom, you know, Mary Jane. But Mary Jane's birthday's Wednesday, and I miss her. She's going to be gone four years this year, mm. and my grandfather. They live over at Calvary Cemetery, and when I saw that the guy's book, his name is William Donahue, but he spells it with an A, I, we spell it with an O. It's the second time tonight that Donahue came up hmm. on Facebook on two different posts. It's an affirmation, and I wanted to tell you, because my grandfather's first name was William D. Donahue. Oh, really? And when I saw, yes, yes. So, and um, and when I was going between your page and Greg's post, and I was coming to my living room because the, the wind's going crazy, I was looking at my, I'm in my living room and I was hearing a voice calling my name. Ooh. And it was like a very male voice. But it's not a negativity or anything. It's just my mom calling. But um, when you were talking about earlier about what you experienced with the bed rolling up, like lifting up and doing the waves, well, that happened not to me, but my sister. Oh, really? When I was, yes, I remember I was in my crib. I think I was about a year old. And a lot of things happened in my bedroom back then. And I still remember the Disney character videos coming on the windows, like both sides of the windows, like on each side of the wall with the music. I remember all this. And I remember my sister's bed lifting up in the air and doing the waves and coming back down. Oh, wow. Yes. And I guess feel like I had to tell somebody because you really have to watch who you tell because a lot of people don't believe me. Oh, yeah, but, I know. That's why yes, I do the show, and I still, Yes, and the other thing I remember, because my mom had, we had Uncle Ron, we had people and just my mom, because my mom was separated and all, but he was here to help us out. And I remember this. I felt like some type of, like, entity in my crib, and I did not want to turn around. Mm. And I felt the feet and hands going around my hair and and breathing. And uh, it was, like, for a few minutes. I was, like, I think I was about three years old, three. And finally, when it got over, I jumped out came into the living room with my mom and Uncle Ronnie, and I told them something had me around my hair, and I felt like a monkey or something. I don't know what it was. Uh, Till this day, Jason, I'm still wondering what was in my crib. Uh, I I still don't know what the green floating head was when I saw him. I was four or five years old. I mean, these things that children see that, you know, people probably write off and their child tells them don't because I, I do think kids see things that others do not. And they and these things know that children can see them. 
Right. And even with those cartoon characters, like, it was like the square pictures, and it would be like Three Little Pigs, Daffy Duck, or, and it was filming back and forth at, at the same time. I felt like I was in a movie theater. Mm-hmm. And, and then years later, I was about like eight years old. And laying in my bed, my back towards the wall. And it was like getting when the sun was rising, and I got a tap on the shoulder. And I heard my name being called Z, Z, turn around, turn around. I hopped from my bed all the way to the front, to the doorway, and went to my mom's room. And I told my mom the next morning, when we, my mom, we got up and I showed, told my mom, went into the room, my bed, there was a weird drawing on the wall. Mm. And, and after that, we painted the bedroom. Mm. I still remember this. Wow, D. That, that's crazy. But, but we had like Keith Linder on. I remember him. I mean, it drew all kinds of stuff on his walls. If it was a you know a demon, a demon in Seattle case, you know, it's crazy the things that happen when it, when you start getting into the demonic and an actual demonic infestation and the amount of the weird activity that happens. It it, it blows the mind. Oh yeah. Oh well, yeah. Thank you so much, D, for calling in. You take care uh, of yourself. Good luck with your results too. I will. What I'll do is I'll text you later other stuff that I've I've experienced because I don't want anybody else to hear it. Okay. But I'll text you both later. Bye. Okay. All right. Thanks, Steve. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Dee's got me on Messenger. You can email me if you've had experiences. I always forget this, too. You can always email me, and I'm going to make sure I get this email right. It's my it's my go-to email for people. If you have paranormal stories, you do want to share with me. I should get this out there. D reminds me of this. A paranormal soup, J, just the letter J, and then my last name, Bland, at gmail.com. So paranormal soup, J, Bland, at gmail.com. Paranormal soup, J, Bland, at gmail.com. If you want to email me, Stories like Dee sends me, I, I love to hear it. I love uh, every, everybody's story. I don't know how you as a writer, um, I know you, you have to be interested in hearing people's personal stories, but every every story I hear to me is like a piece of a puzzle to, to the mystery. Yeah, absolutely. Um, whether it's something paranormal or just uh, everyday conversations, it just helps you yeah. understand people. Um, that's, yeah. that's the best thing about Doing my day job that I do, it's just you get to you get to understand how people think and what they go through, and sometimes you get to hear stories like these or or other folks, and uh, it really makes you feel for them. Yeah, I mean, and you know, the interesting part too, she, you know, with children, you know, I, like I, I talked about, I see all the green floating head when I was a kid. I, I had all other kinds of weird stuff when I was a kid. You it makes you wonder, you know, that as a parent. Uh, you know, that's the last thing you want to hear is your child seeing something scary or demonic or weird like that. I get cases. I mean, for parents, that's the whole reason they're calling me is because their child is experiencing these things. And to me, that's the most frightening. I don't want those cases as a paranormal investigator because they're the most serious to me. I don't, there's yeah. nothing to play around that with when it, when it concerns children. And I try to, to reiterate to people, yes, children have imaginations. Yes, they can make up stuff. And I, I experienced that as a parent. But listen to your children. There could be something that they're experiencing. Uh, we, we had that what a couple weeks ago, or whatever we cover on the worldwide. What weird a guy? We're talking about TikTok. You know, like how is TikTok influencing people? Is it demonic or not? Well, there's a big thing in the paranormal community with everybody making paranormal ghost TikTok videos. And there's a guy who's been putting videos up of his daughter be like one of her being pulled under the bed. I don't know if you've seen that. No. Uh, on one of our episodes we did recently. Wow. Uh, his daughter's being pulled under the bed and she's terrified. You know, it's a child. She's not acting. Whatever's happening to her is terrifying her. And my point was like, great and all, you're throwing this up on TikTok, but you need to help your daughter. Because she's four, terrified. When I was four and five and started having mine, I was really, really lucky that my parents knew that I wasn't a storyteller, that they knew what type of things I was exposed to and if I was saying I saw something or something was happening um, I saw something so they would actually help me investigate it listen and yeah 
yeah, they listened and it helped me through my, you know, my life. I always got to keep that open mind and, and keep exploring and never felt like there was something wrong with it. We got to we got to go to our last commercial break. Uh, one of the, one of the aspects I'd like to talk about, and, and again, if there's there shouldn't be children listening to this show really tonight, um, is the sexual aspect of demons mm. in this because there's there's real and, and when you get down like Gavin Lee Davies, a fr- mutual friend of ours, uh, has covered this like in his ghost sex violation, some very graphic experiences people have had with being raped by something I would consider demonic to be able to do what it did. So we can get into that what influenced you because there's definitely a the, the demons have sex in this book uh, aspect of that would influence you. All right, guys, we'll be right back after a short commercial break. Transmission of unknown origin. Transmission? Out here? SOS. Human. Unknown. Alien. Certificate X. Exclusive engagement at the Odeon Leicester Square. Now. Any systematized transmission indicating a possible intelligent origin must be invested. In space, no one can hear you scream. Necromancer Live Show in the Supernatural Symposium live on Facebook, YouTube, and InterfaceDiff.net. This is an APAC Studio presentation. Hi, I'm Barry, owner operator of Barry's Barometer Bard. Lately, I bet you've been lying awake at night asking yourself, how many barometers do I really need? Well, at Barry's Barometer Barn, we think you need more than one. Otherwise, we're going to go out of business. Remember, at Barry's Barometer Barn, we don't know the meaning of high pressure sales. Come on, folks, buy another barometer. I'm trying to put my kids through college. I've got a family to support and a secret mistress who isn't cheap. Visit Barry's Barometer Barn, 000 Storm Drive. Come on, folks, buy a barometer. I'm Barry's older brother, Larry. And every time one of you people walk past the store without coming in, Barry beats me. (laughs) This has been a presentation from Tim Morgan's APAC Studio. For more almost professional amateur comic studio content, visit the APAC YouTube channel. Search APAC 2002. That's APAC 2002 on YouTube. When Alex Gardner is asleep, he has an extraordinary gift. The government wants it. The scientists want it. But to keep it may cost him his life. It might be better if Alex didn't sleep at all. But he cannot resist entering the dreamscape. Can you? See Dreamscape in the West End and all over London now. Certificate 15. It takes an extraordinary adventurer to enter the dreamscape. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in Paranormal Talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. Join us every Wednesday night at midnight Eastern Standard Time for Weird Wednesday at the live stream with your host, Jamie, the Living Dead Girl, and Rob, the Phantom, where we'll talk about all things paranormal, including Zodiac, astrology, tarot card and oracle card readings, live ghost boxing and spirit communication, 
where we'll do Voices from Beyond the Cold Case Files. So we hope you join us live on Facebook and YouTube every Wednesday night at midnight Eastern Standard Time. We hope to see you there. Bye-bye. is alive. Join us and take a walk on the weird side when you tune in to the Kingdom of Nye, hosted by Heather Wade, the finest in late night talk. Listen live free weeknights starting at 9 p.m. Pacific time at thekingdomofnigh.com, talkstreamlive.com, and the Paranormal Radio app. Want to take a ride? Since 1948, Fate Magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown, all of them true. Fate Radio is carrying on that tradition, bringing you the unusual, macabre, strange, and bizarre. Join host Cat Hops Sunday nights from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. you could accept the fact that this city is headed for a disaster of biblical proportion. Well, what do you mean, biblical? What he means is Old Testament, Mr. Yes. Mayor. Real wrath of God type stuff. Exactly. Fire and brimstone coming down from the skies. Rivers and seas boiling. Forty years of darkness, earthquakes, volcanoes. The dead rising from the grave. Human sacrifice, dogs and cats living together. Mass hysteria. <laughs> You're listening to Paranormal Soup, bringing you the weird every Sunday night. Call into the show and join the discussion. The call-in lines are 219-230-4444 or 260-225-9419 or by Skype caller ID 00JBland00 or JBland Paranormal Soup. And now to your host, Jason Bland. Tonight, we've been talking to guest Bill Downey, who is the author of Burn, Beautiful Soul. He's also the author of Too Much Poison, Brain Cradle, Filthy Beast. Of course, we've been talking about demons tonight. And, uh, you know, on a funny side and pop culture, but also on the serious side, we've had some really good calls tonight about people's experiences. And I think anybody, and the phone lines are still open if you want to call in and join that discussion. I'd still love to hear about anybody's experiences with the demonic. I mean, <clears throat> again... It's fun to look at the dark side, have a laugh. I, I like I said, my favorite movies have to do with the afterlife, some of them with the demonic and hell and all that. But there is a serious. I do take the, the subject serious, and so does Bill. He knows there, there's a serious side to this, too. Uh, but call in, join the show. Well, let's get back to our guest. Now, I mentioned before uh, break. Well, let me get Rob back in here. Hold on. I mentioned before the break um, about the sexual side to this, that demons, you know, like your demon has junk <laughs> that's floating around. Uh, but that, that there's the sexual side of this. One of the most physical aspects in real life demonic cases that I've seen is like I said, Gavin Lee Davies, a mutual friend of ours, uh, in his book, Ghost Sex, The Violation, is a really serious book. I remember when I first had him on, people thought it was going to be funny or something like that. It's not. It was. It's a, he, he almost regretted the title. <laughs> but it, it's a serious case, you know, the woman being raped physically, what, feeling something penetrate her. Is not to get too graphic about it, but she's not the only one. Uh, uh, Barry, Dr. Barry Taft that I've had on the show, uh, the one of the most famous cases is um, The Entity case we made a movie Robert you know, Hershey, and yeah. The, yeah well that is a real life case the Barry Taff I've had on the show dealt with and in that she felt you know two little beans holding her down and this physical other physical big bean penetrating her that's physical you know like is this you know you know whatever they be that means they have junk I mean, they could be you know incorporeal or whatever or wisp of smoke but not these 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 experiences that people have had it's physical. It, they feel that penetration. That means there's there's some kind of sexual 
being there. And if you look back through all the cultures and history of succubus and incubus, there's some sexual nature to that. So how did that influence you when you decided, okay, my my demons are going to have, you know, boy and girl parts and and have sex? Yeah. Um, as I mentioned in our fiery home, fiery home with the demons. Again, there's there's boy girl, there's boy girl, yeah, there's boy demons, there's girl demons, and um, there is a lot of uh, activity. We'll say there there is a lot of sex. Um, in in a lot of cases, it's it's similar to what we just talked about. The case with the entity, it's 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 being used um, almost as a weapon. It's being used to yes. inflict pain and punishment. Um, in this case, it's demon on demon. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, if you, that, that's kind of what I, what, I, what I was thinking about, about the worst possible place, about the worst thing that someone can encounter, uh, rape has got to be up there. Um, yeah. I, I, I honestly, I almost shied away from that in the book just because it's such a, it's such a terrible thing. And, uh, and, and there is, again, there, there's humor in the book, there's everything else. Um, but there's, it's also very serious. Um, yeah. and that was my concern about it, that it being taken almost flippantly. But uh, right. yeah, because it's 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 it's, some, it's just about the worst thing you can imagine. But that's you know, see, I've you know, I've talked about demons being like parasitic. But the thing that throws that out for me are these instances where people have where they feel they're being raped by something physical, non-human. Uh, I mean, when you hear the descriptions of women that have gone through this, mm -hmm. uh, it, they feel the member, they feel the penetration, and there's countless countless experiences of this have been re retold by women and that's the hardest probably it's one of the hardest experiences i'm sure for somebody to tell mm. um you know i mean it, it i've always been fascinated by it because of its relationship to alien abduction and that how that deals with sex and you know back in the ancient past maybe they're describing alien abduction right but when you hear people's nowadays experiences you know or in recent history like the entity you know that there is something incorporeal that can be physical at some point and rape somebody and you know and how who do you tell i was raped by a, a demon or a ghost right. you, know, you can't tell that to anybody you know and, and like in the entity case what's so scary about that story and it's a real story is she was so alone and, and disappears alone and it's still you know years later when they find her she was still dealing with it on some level you, it makes you the scary thought about that is you wonder how many people it might not just be women men could be you know going through this too um right. are experiencing this kind of level of you know rape and not be able to tell anybody just yeah, like there, an, somebody an alien abduction right uh, there's such a there's such a stigma associated with it with it to begin with let alone add in the whole supernatural element it's a, it's how how someone would go through that and still want to live has got to be really difficult right and like i said how many people are going through this right now that are dealing with it on our personal level they, they can't tell anybody not even their closest friend or confident because right. they'll think they're crazy and I, that's what my empathy is for because of my experience i wasn't raped or anything like that but i was assaulted in so many other ways it always makes me wonder how many people are going through these experiences alone it's one of the reasons why i do this show hmm. As an open forum for people to share and not be criticized. I won't be the one criticizing them. I won't allow people to do it because we all have to have a way to be able to talk about these things. That, like I said, they're all, everybody's story is a, a piece of the puzzle to the mystery of, of what it is. Now, I don't want to give too much away. And like I said, I'm only 15 chapters in the, the book, but there seems like there's a, there's a relationship the demon has with a, a human. Yes. Um... So this gets back to this gets back to other themes that uh, about past lives, about forward lives, future lives. Um, but yes, there. So there is um, there. There's a love interest, there's a human love interest uh, with Basil, and uh, it's a, it's an attorney who works in the same office building. And uh, there's a very tender moment. It's a uh, it's uh, they they go on a nice date, and uh, Basil dresses up for the occasion. Um, and it's it's. To me, I, that's actually my favorite chapter in the book, just because uh, you're showing an intimate conversation between two beings. Um, one, one, of course, is inhuman, but um, I, I just thought it was, uh, I, I thought it was very, I'll go with the word tender. <laughs> well, it's interesting because that's what I, I, like I said, I don't want to give too much away, but I wondered about the reincarnation aspect. What are, what are your thoughts on reincarnation? We talk about a lot on this show. Yeah. I, to, I, I, I hope there's an afterlife. I hope there, that this isn't it. I mean, I, I, I love my life. And I love being here. Um, I don't want it to end. 
Um, but uh, yeah, I would love, uh, and I, I don't mean this flippantly, but I, I would love to see my dogs again, things like that. Um, I, I would love there to be something. Um, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure what I believe. Um, I, I, I think I'll be surprised either way. But do you believe in the possibility that you could, I mean, raise, definitely raising a Catholic upbringing, this wasn't a, addressed, but right. being a Gnostic now, I mean, do you question, you think maybe you've lived other lives? I have a friend of mine, she characterizes herself as kind of a light worker. And we talk about this stuff a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I'm open to pretty much any possibility. Uh, I, I don't pretend to know either way. Um, so I'm open to the idea of, of God. I'm open to the idea of, of devils, uh, demons. I'm open up. I'm, I'm open to reincarnation. There's, there's, there's very little I, I wouldn't be open to. Um, I try not to think about it too much because I don't know the answer. See, I don't know the answer, and it makes me think about it more. Is that right? My, okay. Yeah, and I, I see this in my nine-year-old, because whenever we get in these conversations, you know, like, you know, I don't think a lot of people are having with a nine-year-old, but me and my nine-year-old dude, Dean, uh, he, he's like, I just need to know the answer. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know the answer, kiddo. And if you keep thinking about it, you still won't know the answer, but I understand why your brain just doesn't want to shut it down, you know, because right. it's a mystery. It must be solved. And my, and my son's like me. He's geared to just can't look away. Keep thinking about it. Try to figure out the mystery. And, I, and that's why I say it. That's why I love. That's why I do the show, because it's I want to hear people's stories. They're all pieces of a puzzle to a, a huge mystery of what we're living in life, mm. the world. I mean, I, I, I don't buy that we live in this just totally material world and none of these things exist. None of it's real. I, I, I don't buy that. I'm not an, a complete skeptic at all. Nowhere near it. I am a believer in something, you know, there is something going on. There's something I'm definitely, for me, past lives are an accepted reality just because I've had two very vivid dreams to me that only explanation to me, they were past lives mm. and they were so emotional, so real. I feel so lucky to have had those two dreams. I think they were gifts to show me the reality of past lives, but I, I, I'm a, I'm a believer in that. And reading your book, there's a little story that starts to unfold in there. That that's why I wondered what your, your take was on past lives, if they had something to do with it. So I don't give too much away, but that, that's what I wondered. Yep. I, I, um, that, that's a, you're onto it. So I, I'm open <laughs> to the, I'm open to those ideas. Yeah, and then, then I think about Spawn, Atomic Furl, and all that stuff. <laughs> I don't, that's why I want to finish the book. I do want to finish the book, but that's why, that's why I don't try to finish the book before I do an interview like this, because then I might totally give it away with, without helping it. So you definitely got to check out this book, Burn Beautiful Soul. Um, now, in a, in a, in a sense, um, you know, demons in pop culture, what are, what are some of your um, favorite movies like, mm. that, that feature demons? What, what are some of your favorite movies? Uh, we we talked about some of them, like The Exorcist, uh, Rosemary's yeah. Baby. That's uh, that's ooh that, that's yeah. Good. I just read that book for the first time last year. It was uh, very really? good. Yeah, yeah. I read that back in high school. Oh my Is that God. right? But yes. But I felt I felt like the book was way more terrifying than the movie. Absolutely. Way more terrifying. I still don't feel like there's been a you know I I don't know. Did they remake Rosemary's Baby? I think they did, didn't they? I didn't see it, but I don't. It's like I don't think anybody's ever going to capture what they did in that book. There was the they did a sequel of some sort. I don't know if I've seen a, a, a yeah. recreation, but um, I would say my favorite movie that that talks about this is probably Frailty from the early oh, 2000s. Yes, 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 yes. Oh my god, I love that movie. Oh, yeah. that's such a good one. Yes. Oh yes, that's so deeply disturbing on so many levels. So yeah. Bill, Bill, was it Bill Paxton? Bill Paxton and uh, Matthew McConaughey. Yeah. Yes. Oh my god, that's such a good movie. If you haven't seen Frailty, people, not for children, go see Frailty. Go rent it. It's worth the watch. It's so good. I don't. That's a, that's something you can't talk about because you don't want to give too much away in that. You got to let the surprise be there for people. Right. Oh, but that's so good. Yeah. So I, I, I that was that was probably like my biggest one. I mean, it follows. I thought was pretty interesting from a couple of years ago talking about the sexual aspect of things. I'm not even yeah, sure if you would describe one. that as a as a demon. Uh, certainly a malevolent figure, but uh, that's uh, it was certainly entertaining. You know, uh, was the one you know, one I thought was really good. Was it Fallen? No, not Fallen. Now that Michael Douglas. No, what was it called? It was the one with Denzel Washington. Oh yeah, I think you're right. Uh, I think it is Fallen. Yeah, is Falling Down fallen? was. Falling, Falling Down, I think, is the one with uh, Michael, Michael Douglas. Douglas. That's, right. That's right. Fallen. It was just Fallen. Yeah, where like the demon just like he he's on a serial killer case, and it's actually the serial killer is possessed by a demon, and then like just touches people, 
and like it it falls that's a really good one actually mm. i thought I, I like that one a lot uh is again the possession thing that's that's to me is the scariest element of demons yeah <laughs> you know they, they could take over or be somebody and that one it's just jumping from person to person yeah friends you know like it easily is possessing people yeah. one of the ones i thought was it, it was kind of it was kind of sort of funny and maybe unintentionally but uh drag me to hell was entertaining because of how from... bad it was yeah yeah it was entertaining it was entertaining it was you know, some of those movies are entertaining just because they're so bad Mm -hmm. Like, it's all right to like bad movies. Like, I hate critics are like, you. They, if you like that movie, what's wrong with you? No, it's all right to like, I have some of my favorite movies are probably awful, <laughs> you know, like, in, you know, in, in a critic's aspect. But otherwise, I still love them for their awfulness. Yeah. That one could be one. That could be a cult classic eventually. I don't know. But it's so bad, it's good. Right. You know, and but I, like I said, there's been so, uh, so much in pop culture with demons and stuff. And as, you know, the years have gone on, and there's more i guess i don't want to say acceptance of demons that sounds horrible you know but like fascination more of a fascination with the demonic world probably since the exorcist these, these movies get either more you know broader funny or more terrifying like all the conjuring films are doing now oh yeah i think it's also interesting that you're seeing uh, we talk i don't actually don't think we talked about someone like hellboy or uh like constantine oh, yeah. like or, an like, anti-hero exactly someone who's yeah, yeah. like got some of that spawn spawn someone who's got that demon in them but there's also a little bit of of humanity a little bit of goodness in there too and that just they're they're great characters have you ever read any of the jeff jeff Lindsay uh dexter novels no i highly recommend it yeah if you're interested in that kind of because you know why what what with as much as i love the tv show jeff Lindsay's original books the tv show steers away from a whole aspect of those books about dexter that the tv show does not touch upon Upon. Hmm. but jeff Lindsay does in subtle ways throughout the, all the books is that dexter has a demon oh is that right yeah the dark dark passenger is really a demon interesting yeah it's a really interesting aspect it, you know for people who watch the show tv tv show dexter and you go to the books you, you the first book will be like oh yeah this is very much like the tv show but then towards the end it totally diverges differently than what the tv show did and there's this whole aspect of like Dexter's dark passenger and the reason he doesn't have his own soul in a way the reason he doesn't have emotion is because of this dark passenger this demon that got into him when he was a child from of course seeing his mother brutally murdered in front of him but it, it's a whole aspect about trauma and how things could get attached to a child or somebody from trauma like that well wow, now I'm interested okay yeah sadly Jeff Lindsay ends the whole series just as badly as they end the tv show though just to okay. warn you it's, it's, not, it's like both, like the TV show and Jeff Lindsay. Both of you need to correct that. They are. There's going to be a new Dexter series coming out to make it better than that crappy ending. But Jeff Lindsay, I don't think he's coming back to write any more Dexter. But he ended it just as badly as the show, which was disappointing because hmm. it was otherwise a really good series of books uh, that he did for Dexter. I think he just got tired of it. Okay. You know, but that's an anti hero. He, he's like an anti hero again, you know, doing real bad things, but for a kind of good cause. You right. Know, like Spawn, you know, Tom McFarlane Spawn. He was an assassin that goes to hell and makes a deal with the devil, comes back, you know. You know, the aspect, uh, Tom McFarlane's hell, just to talk about that, the way like things are born in hell. You know, I, I love that in the comic books. Like there's, there's a whole aspect of that makes you wonder. Um, were you also, we we're running out of time, but I'm, I'm sorry, I got to geek out on horror and oh, this kind right. of here. So, you ever read Clive Barker? I read, uh, what is it, Ab Aberat, I think. That mm -hmm. was, um, so I read that. <sighs> One or two others. I, to be completely honest with you, I read very little horror. I probably read maybe five or six horror novels a year. Um, I'm probably past that already this year, but um, no, what do, you, what do you like from him? Books of Blood, his okay. three book, small short story series. Hmm. There's a good story in there, and I wish I had looked it up before tonight, uh, but I was thinking about it when we were just thinking about demons. One of my favorite demonic fictional stories is a short story by Clive Barker. And in this story, I don't wanna give too much away, but it's a short story, so I guess I'm not totally ruining it. But uh, it's, it's from a demon's perspective, like yours in a sense, but this is an incorporeal demon. This is a demon that nobody can see, and it's trying to get at people, this family trying to get their attention it's doing all these things to get their attention and to mess with them and do horrible things and the family just seems not affected it's a really good short story uh, and he's got mm. other stuff that's very demonic books blood and of course there's hellraiser 
you know which is he says isn't hell you know it's like this alternate dimension that that's you know if that's hell it's ooh. You know, I, I was fascinated by like Hellraiser movies and Clyde Barker. He's one of my, besides Stephen King, one of my favorite horror writers. Okay. I, when, when I was younger, I used to read a lot of horror. Now I, I don't. There's too right. much evilness in the world. It's hard, actually. Like the beginning of your book. I, I, I love your book, but it's hard for me. I don't get into dark things like that read anymore. Like reading's an escape, and I want to get away from the darkness sometime. I'm with you. Yeah. You know, there's there's already enough bad in the world. <laughs> Sometimes when I was younger, though, I ate that stuff up. I read a yeah. ton of horror novels. You know, I used to be totally into it. And horror movies. Now I don't. I honestly don't watch much of horror anymore. It, it's hard. Like my five year old wants to. <laughs> he's begging me to watch movies. Like you're never watching that until you're 18. Right. And he's like, no, Dad. I he's like fascinated by horror and monsters and all that stuff. I'm like, oh my god, I created a monster. Do you have any kids of your own? Uh, no, we have all animals, so we have uh, oh, dogs, dog cats, snakes, things like that. But Oh, snakes, see? Yeah. Oh, no. Not a pet, man. <laughs> Rob Great. down there has snakes, too. Oh, is that right? <laughs> awesome. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I reptile love lovers. my snakes. Oh, jeez. Yeah. What do you guys have? People. Oh, I've had Burmese python. I've had all sorts of constrictors and little snakes and... Lots of stuff. Nice. Same here. I was big into ball pythons. Oh, all right. See, how do people have pets and snakes? What's wrong with you? <laughs> it's better than just... At least a snake doesn't rip your face off and eat it. That's true. <laughs> I might just, you know, I mean, you get a big enough, you know, python, I might try to eat you. There's been cases right. of that. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, I love the videos when people have like the 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 snake gone wrong videos. Like, see, see, you know, like the the person has a snake clamped them, they can't get it off. I'm like, see, see, could have got it, could have got a bunny, you know, we could have got a dog, but you had to get a snake, you had to get a snake, because they're just they're not they, they'd eat you if they were big enough. That's true. <laughs> you know, of course I say that about cats too, and I love my cat. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know if she'd eat me if she was big enough, but I've always said that about cats. They look oh, at yeah, you like, yeah, if, yeah, if I was big <laughs> enough, I'd probably eat you. you know? I, I say that, but I love cats. What's a tiger? What's a lion? It's a big ass cat. <laughs> you know, but people have those big ass cats as, as pets. I mean, yeah. it didn't yeah, work out crazy. for Sigmund and Freud, but, <laughs> you know, but yeah, I mean, don't have a demon as a pet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there was a there was a book um, from I mentioned Christopher Moore a few years uh, mm -hmm. from Moore. He has a book called Practical Demon Keeping. And uh, there's a guy that, has a demon named Catch, I think it is. But that, that was that fun. sounds familiar. Oh, Christopher Moore. I think I've seen that. Yes, I've heard of this. Uh, you know, I don't I haven't read it, but I've heard of that book. I got to check that out. You know, that's the, the demons can be, like I said, light humor and all that, but there is a darkness, you know, don't go dabbling in the demonic. It's just like having a, a you know, a pet snake. It, it might bite you. Yep. <laughs> you might have a bad time. You know, that, that, that's why, you know, I try to tell people, you know, they get into the paranormal, you know, they see all these TV shows and they see people going about and going to places. There's a demon here and all that stuff. I'm like, if there really was a demon here, these people should be getting out. You know, you don't want to, don't mess with this stuff like Most that. Most right? of no. it are negatives that had a bad attitude in life. They see people come in, they know they can just say, Satan, devil, demon, and they're all going to run with their tails between their legs. Or be like, come at me, bro. <laughs> they don't know. For the most yeah. cases. Yeah, I know. I mean, but they all, well, there's a fascination in our culture with the dark side, the demons. You know, that I, I see it on the show, like, uh, the ghost sex violation that I had, uh, you know, with the darkness and evil things like that, or they're demonic. When I had Gavin Lee's Davies on, that was like the most views I've ever gotten for a show. Oh, wow. You know, now it's a, it's the evil dark side stuff. People are like, Ooh, let me see, you know, it's just like seeing a horror movie. It's like, you know, Oh, it's not going to happen to me, but I can watch it and have a little bit of a scare. Yeah. But that's the thing with the, when you get into the, the real life stories of demonic hauntings, that's really scary because it could happen to you. Like, you know, and maybe just your attention to it can make it come to you. But that curiosity also gets satisfied and, and you learn from that, from hearing yeah. other people's experiences. You hope so. You hope so. <laughs> did you ever mess with the Ouija board when you were uh, back in the day? Me? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we did all that stupid stuff. <laughs> I, I wouldn't do, I wouldn't, that's the thing. I wouldn't do that now. I wouldn't. Right. 
you know, that's a, that's why like when I start getting too deep into into these these characters, I, I just kind of have to step away from it because, like you said, I don't want to draw anything. I don't want to draw anything to me. I was you were watching. Uh, yeah, I mentioned Stephen King is one of my favorite horror writers, and one of my all time favorite books is The Stand, and we're we watching mm-hmm. we're watching the remake they did of that. And in in that, I love that you know the 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 TV show miniseries they did not cover this part in the book with this character Nadine Cross. Mm-hmm. They totally just didn't do it in the miniseries, and I mm-hmm. love. I have to say, I'm loving the remake. As much as I have to pounce on like how Hollywood remakes stuff and kills it, I am loving the remake because they put one aspect of that book into the story they didn't in the in the original miniseries. Is that Nadine Cross summons Randall Flagg, the the walking dude, through a Ouija board when she's a little girl. Hmm. That's how she's Nadine, my queen. It all comes. It's really creepy in the book because it falls her for all. She she's she's sworn to him. She doesn't have sex with anybody. Like she's waits to beat him speaking of sex you know they do it out in the desert when he finally like draws her to him i don't know if anybody's read the stand or seen the miniseries or seen the new one but i don't want to give give it away if you haven't but it's been out there for years it's one of my favorite novels i have the unedited version it's really good i don't know if you're a fan of that book at all my wife just finished my wife finished it she's a slow reader but it took her about a year and a half to finish that but uh yeah she said she loved it. i haven't read it i've seen the miniseries but i have heard great things See, the, the original miniseries is, you know, it's good, but it does not do the book justice. And he has a whole unedited version, like, or unabridged version that he released years later, uh, what he originally wanted to publish. And they're like, hmm. no, way, way too long, Stephen King, way too long. He had to wait till he's like, I'm Stephen King now, I'm releasing it. And the unedited versions, even, or, you know, unabridged, whatever you want to call it, all the extra 300 pages is worth it. It's, it's long, but it's worth it. And I always found it one of the scariest aspects of The Stand is this Nadine Cross. Mm. And she she's the one if he, it, that brings Randall Flagg just from a Ouija board into this universe. Uh, it, it, like, she's the key. You know, it's a subtle thing he puts in the story, and they just totally left it alone in the miniseries because it's a lot to do with sex and stuff like that. Uh, but they're doing it in the remake, and I, I, I haven't finished it yet, so I'm really excited to do that. Any uh, last information you want to get out to the audience or your website or uh, upcoming projects you're going to be doing? Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, uh, website is uh, wjdonahue.com. That's W-J-D-O-N-A-H-U-E.com. Uh, upcoming project that is, just got published in a new anthology. It's actually a, a demon story, Demons of Chicago, it's called, but it's not Ooh. about real demons. Um, so that's in an anthology called uh, Shocking Verbs, Lawless Nouns. And um, then, like I said, I had two other novels, novels I'm shopping right now. So hopefully one of those hits uh, sometime this year. And uh, otherwise, just uh, keep it on, keep it on. Well, I, I've been, uh, Chicago's like right next door to me. So you have a, it, this Demons in Chicago, is, what, what is that about? I'm just uh, curious. Demons of Chicago. So it's or about, um, it's about an aging heavy metal singer in a band called Demons of Chicago, and uh, he's regretting his his kind of life choices. He's at the end where he's kind of no longer passionate about the music, but he's still doing it and uh, just trying to make peace with it. All right. Well, it's the Demons of Chicago. I'm like, ooh. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Bill, for being on this show. I would, can't wait to finish reading "Burn Beautiful Soul." Definitely check it out, people. It's I'm like I said, 15 chapters in. I'm already totally entertained and can't wait to finish it. And I already have an idea where it might be going, but I, I like like to be surprised. So, all right, thanks again, Bill. That's it for the show, guys. We will be back next Sunday with guest medium Jonah K. She's gonna uh, I think do readings on the air if I remember right. Maybe not, but we're gonna medium Jonah K on the on the show next Sunday. Same bad time, same bad channel. 11 p.m. to 1 a.m. Eastern or 11 p.m. to 2 a.m. Eastern, 10 p.m. to 1 a.m. Central, 8 p.m. to 11 p.m. Pacific time. Thanks for everyone who shares out the show. Thank you to our Patreons who donate to the show because it does help pay the bills. You can find us on Patreon under Paranormal Soup, Jason Bland. Check us out there. And we're live every Sunday night on Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, and the Paranormal Radio app. Check us out. All right, guys, thanks for watching. See you next week. Oh, my God.